fast, have fun. Welcome, welcome, welcome to Kicking Horse Golden BC for stop number three of the Freeride World Tour 2023. Kicking Horse Mountain Resort sits high up in the Purcells, right on the border of the Rockies, towering over the beautiful Canadian town of Golden BC, the champagne powder capital of Canada. This is its fifth year on the Freeride World Tour and has fast become a favorite of riders and fans alike. It's known for huge terrain, big lines and is home to a whole range of free ride events. We've got juniors all the way up to the free ride world tour. My name is Derek Foos and unfortunately for you, but fortunately for me, we've lost Anna Smoothie to an ankle injury, but we have the next best thing, big brother, legendary free ride world tour rider, Sam Smoothie. Sam, welcome to Kicking Horse. I'm very happy to be here. Just was over the, uh, over the pass in Revelstoke and just thought I'd pop on over to say hello. All right, well, we're really stoked to have you and bring your unique uh, take on the Freeride World Tour. We're gonna have a quick look at the order of the day. We are gonna be running our snowboard men first starting at 8.30 a.m. That is very, very soon. Ski men gonna be the second category, ski women, and then snowboard women rounding out the day. Sam, we switch the order every time when you were competing. Did you have kind of a favorite? Did you like to drop in the first category or wait till a little bit later? To be honest, uh, to me, it kind of depended on the conditions and the, and the venue. Uh, in terms of the show itself, I always thought it went quite well. If we had some fresh snow, the snowboarders went went earlier. Um, they can just put on such a great show in that, just throwing up those huge calves and airs, and uh, leaving the skiers to mop up the <laughs> mop up the mess. Well, that's perfect because the snowboard men are dropping first today, and the ozone face in absolutely great shape. It uh, dusted a nice little five centimeters last night. Here's our judges panel. This is the cream of the crop. Laurent Best, the uh, the commissioner of the Freeride World Tour. Rachel Croft, Freeride World Tour athlete and podium finisher. Laurent Gauthier finished on the podium in Verbier. He knows what he's doing. Bertie Denevo, legendary. Multiple wins on the back. And Jeff Holden going to be our video judge. Canadian uh, icon in the Freeride World Tour. Freeride World, I should say. So we are we are ready and they are ready. Yeah, I'm really, uh, really happy to see these guys. Uh... <laughs> Dirt is definitely on. The pressure for being under the cut, it's pretty intense. You know, it's make or break. I'm under the cut and I want to try to make it. You have to be focused that if you want to stay, it's a war. You might be wanting to push it harder to get a good result and risk it. For my run, I feel like the cut will change it because I want to go big, but I also need a run that I can land. I have to win this next one. Here at Kicking Horse, the cut looming over everything. There's a lot of riders, uh, I'd say, familiar faces on tour on the downhill side of the cut that are going to be looking to make a big splash on the face today. There's a lot of new riders, fresh faces, sitting way up in the ranking. So definitely a bit of a shakeup. But of course, with a ton of points on offer today, uh, it's still all to play for. And as, as we heard there from Abel and Jess and Craig, they're, uh, they're not too worried about it, but they're definitely thinking about it. Yeah, it is a veritable pressure cooker out there today with the third competition of the year. Uh, as you say, we've got riders really looking to stamp their mark to guarantee their spot into the final two stops uh, or be sent back down to the Challenger Series. It's, it's going to be really tough, especially with the conditions we have today. Yeah, in, an intense day. All right, we're going to take a little bit of a look at the ozone face. Sam, run us through what we're looking at today. All right, so here we have the ozone face. This is the fourth time the Freeride World Tour has competed here. As you can see, it's a wide, sweeping venue with numerous line options with a lot of spread across the face. It's a southeast aspect, uh, which we've just had cross-loaded a little bit by a southerly wind, which is going to create a little bit of variability with the fresh snow being a bit deeper in some places. It's a 44 degree max angle on the slope, but that sort of changes a lot depending on whereabouts you are in the face. We've got 324 meters of vert, so it is one of the shorter venues, but it is packed with a bunch of technical features. 
Yeah, it's going to be really interesting to see where the riders select to go. We've seen the riders left side, the uh, the sort of famous Craig Murray, Marcus Eder zone, get a lot of play. The judges love that when the tricks go down. Uh, some of the middle parts of the face, a little bit thinner. It's a slightly low tide snow year, so we've got some sharks, some rocks in, in those middle zones. The guts of the shoots are all in good shape, um, but the, the high points, the takeoffs are a little bit of a question mark. So we're gonna see how that plays out today for the riders on, on the ozone face. Here with Jess. What's up? <laughs> How's it going? I'm gonna single all the pepper. Yeah. It's gorgeous. I mean, I never seen it before. <laughs> that looks good. <laughs> All right, well, some nervous moments at face check. Always uh, always a bit of a stressful time for the riders as they're just trying to unlock the Da Vinci code on, on any given face. And we're running relatively early in the competition window, so definitely not as much time as some of the riders might have liked to take a look. But we're gonna take a look right now at where we're sitting in Snowboard Man in the big picture overall. We've got Ludo Giodiat with a commanding lead, 16,400 points. Michael Mon with that win in Spain, uh, kind of cementing his spot. And uh, John Powell, Jonathan Penfield jumping way up after a tough start. And then we've got, you know, some really familiar faces down a little bit lower. Cami Armand, who was in the hunt last year for the overall title, is sitting on the on the tough side of the cut. So I think we're going to see, you know, some, some riders coming out swinging. And we may see a little bit of... Um, I don't know, a little bit of, of delicate riding from some of the guys sitting a little bit higher who are already sitting on two results. Do you think they strategize like that or are they just going to go for it anyway? I think it can come down to the athlete. I know uh, a few athletes definitely uh, love a few strategies, a little, little mind games, you know, and some of them will be looking to cement their place, whereas others, they're more intrinsically motivated. All right, well, let's take a look at the order they're going to be dropping in. Our start list today looks like this. So we have Liam Rivera dropping first from Mexico, followed by Enzo Nilo. After that, we have Hans Minich from the USA, Jonathan Penfield, down to Ludovic Giodiat, Holden Samuels, Michael Morn, and brought home by Kami Aman. Yeah, Kami definitely going to be looking to make a big splash here. He He's definitely looking for a big result. Um, his last event in Andorra definitely did not go as planned. A massive scorpion, and he actually had a bit of a back injury out of that. So hoping that he's going to come back firing. We weren't sure if he was even going to show up. So let's see what you guys thought at home. The peak performance fun bet fan favorites. Ludo Giodiat shooting up the rankings with 64% of you guys thinking he is going to finish on the podium. Michael Mann, I mean, that's an easy one kind of he's definitely been been on fire so far this year and Camille Armand uh, the, the the folks at home backing the Frenchman to, to come back swinging yeah what a, what a handsome group of devils as well look at them just big, big grins across their faces yeah I imagine those grins might be a little more serious right now happy to be out here free riding you can see hugs all around Liam Rivera is going to be the first man to drop as he's uh, just kind of getting those last minute preparations. I mean, the nerves are starting to fire. The heart rate's going up now. It's go time. It's crunch time. We've got the cut looming. Our first rider is just about to drop in. Oh, man. Like, I can feel it. Like, I can feel it like I used to be in, in the gate. You know, obviously, this is more about me. Uh, <laughs> you know, this is why, why we're all here. But um, this is that moment where you just feel your heartbeat riding up and you've been waiting, you've been scheming, you've been plotting, and it all comes down to this. Yeah, you were saying this morning in our gondola ride up that you're feeling a lot better about uh, our spot in the booth than, than the rider spot in the start gate. What's that, what's that feel like? I mean, those, those last seconds before you drop in, the intensity of it. 
Yeah, the intensity is huge. Uh, I found I always like tried to kind of like forget a little bit and just kind of relax, enjoy the surroundings as if it's a normal day in the mountains with my friends. Uh, but it's about here that it's pretty hard to ignore. This is about to get super serial. Yeah, just about to get real. And and for the riders having that um, that routine to go through at the start to get themselves into the mindset for performance to to try to keep it, like you said, as normal as possible. It's just snowboarding, mm. and these guys are really good at snowboarding. So if they can just do it as normal as possible, then, then they're going to have success. So Liam Rivera, 23 years old, a rookie Mexican rider, the first Mexican rider on the Freeride World Tour, and the first Mexican rider on the podium, and the first man dropping here at Kicking Horse. Stop number three, and the Freeride World Tour is underway. Oh my gosh, that looks glorious. Don't you just want to give that little windriff a tickle? <laughs> I am absolutely pumped to see how this kicks off. Look at that view. Yeah, so Liam just making his way down the ridge. As we said, we're going to have riders going all over the face. Some hard riders left, and Liam opting for way down to the rider's right. We've got the ridge kind of protected by this cornice, so the riders are going to need to know exactly where they are. And finding landmarks when you're on the uphill side of a cornice is definitely tricky. Uh, Liam, it looks like the snow conditions absolutely fantastic mm -hmm. up on the ridge top. Yeah, that's the thing with this sort of like, also it can be like a blind rollover, uh, which can make picking exactly where you're going to drop in pretty like devoid of landmarks. And he's going away riders right, uh, pretty close to where we saw the forerunner. Yeah, all the way down there. You can see some old tracks there as Liam now into the guts of it and starting off with a bang. Already two features and a 360. Oh, yeah. Perfect powder landing. Oh, what a way to start this comp. Oh, look at that little hips. He's gone... Front three to back three. Liam being a regular ride, just whacking that snow up as he descends into the shade. So Ry Liam holding on to a seventh and a third and sitting in fifth overall. So he is the man on the line for the cut. And I feel like he's done a really nice job of making his claim to get himself into the Freeride World Tour Finals. Two events coming up still, Feverbrun with the two-run format. And then, of course, the, the grand finale on the Bec de Ross in Verbier. Looking like Liam didn't carry quite enough steam there. Let's take a look at this replay. This entrance, I really love that. Getting the grab there, nice little bit of bone as well. Front three off that feature and just absolutely bolts landing. I'd almost like to see the start of that. I think, did he half cab in? Uh, well, we're gonna have to, we'll have another look. So judges uh, lines there, fluidity, um, and, or, sorry, control and technique, absolute maxing, line fluidity, air and style, two 360s, both, spinning both directions. Liam all smiles, face covered in snow, but not from falling, but just from white rooming himself. I think that's going to give the riders who are stacked up at the start gate a huge morale boost. Yeah, I totally agree. And just look at, look at that face. That is a happy, happy little camper. Just pulling up his uh, Verbier Four Valleys buff there. Just how many people in this field are from, like skiing out of Verbier now? All right, score coming in for Liam Rivera, 75-6-7. So the judges definitely, uh, they're loving it. That's a solid score for the first rider of the day. And now we're going to see where the other riders stack up to Liam's run as he takes a spot in the Dynastar hot seat. And uh, we'll see if he settles in for a long haul or a short haul as the rest of the riders up in the start gate definitely keen to take on that spot. Yeah, dropping first is always an interesting one with nothing else to gate for the judges to gauge against. Often setting that first score when it's a clean run with good airs and features like we saw there can be really difficult. I think that's actually quite a great score to start off things. Yeah, I agree. So we go right back up to the top. We've got Enzo Nilo. Enzo was a very, very last minute call up, a wild card to, uh, to join the tour. And he's made a splash already sitting on a sixth and a fifth. Uh, riding on a team, but he's actually from Biarritz. So that surfy style that he rides with probably uh, formed, honed and, and forged in the waves off of uh, the coast to Biarritz, sitting in six right now. So Enzo, he's he's looking for a solid score here to get him just over that line and inside the cut for for Freeride World Tour Finals. Crunch time here at Kicking Horse, and it's still all to play for. Yeah, it is crunch time indeed. Let's see how hungry young Enzo is. All right, well, Enzo Nilo, 29 years old. He's been making his way. He's been filming a bunch. We've seen him on the qualifier tour and making his way onto the big stage here with a wild card super last minute. He had about a week and a half to prepare. And Enzo Nilo, he is on course and looking to make a splash. Yeah, really great to see him getting a good share from his other competitors there as he makes his way down the rider's right ridge. Uh, uh, Enzo, of course, riding regular, so 
Uh, let's see if he's going to pull out a few little tricks from his deep little baggy as well. Yeah, it kind of feels like, especially after seeing Liam spin both ways, I think that's going to be pretty mandatory and, and the conditions the way they are. I mean, just watching Liam land, the, the splash that he made in the powder, definitely um, definitely going to lend itself to some big tricks. So heading down the cornice, just looking for his entry here as Enzo Nilo now airing in, and he is on course. Yeah, and this is one of the interesting parts of the zone. I was really curious to see how many riders are going here. You can see it's quite technical. It's one of the steepest parts of the entire face. He's working his way down to this drop, nailing that takeoff and the landing. Straight off the nose there, and now coming in onto the spine on top of the... Oh, and look, just getting hooked up on his heel side edge. That is an unfortunate tumble, and uh, got to give... Oh. Popped a little pocket there on the rider's right side. And Enzo going out to the left, spinning a 360, so looking to, to salvage a bit from this run. Wow, that's, a, that's an incredible way to just recover things. Just, oh, I'm just gonna chuck another front three, cut a pocket. Yeah, really interesting run there. You could see the intent. He was sort of going for a nose butter on that ridge, but I do wonder, being on the windward side, was that maybe not the spot for that? Yeah, I mean, we, we can kind of see, as you said in, in the face preview, Sam, the, the face is cross-loaded, so the wind's been blowing effectively from left to right um, across the face, and Enzo just getting a little caught up there. Maybe we could have a look and see if we can catch what happened. I love this shot. This is such a great shot of, like, the down angle of that zone. You can see just how steep that was. How's that landing? Yeah, right there. Just hooking that heel side edge. Hopefully he didn't take a little rock to the body. Yeah, I, I think, I was wondering if he got shark there because a lot of the high points, the snow's a little bit thinner, mm. but I think he just didn't complete the rotation there and the heel side edge caught, and unfortunately, that's a, that's a tricky little situation to get out of once you're in it. Yeah, and you can see that there with the judging criteria, control and fluidity and technique, taking a little bit of a hammering for that. Yeah, in the red. So Enzo Nilo into the finish area, checking the base of his board as, uh, yeah, wondering if that was a shark catch or just a heel side edge catch. Mm, mm. So a tough, tough day at the office for Enzo as he was hoping for more and it was such a strong start. Really cool to see. I haven't seen many people in that area, that section of the face. In other years, either the cornice is too big or the rocks are completely covered, so there's not even a feature, mm. but I really like that one straight off the nose. Um, so Enzo Nilo now going to make his way over as we... Wait for the judges. I don't think that's going to trouble Liam in the hot seat, as we saw. But I think we can see there as they uh, examine his board, uh, that it did, did look like he hooked a solid shark on that. I mean, being from Biarritz, you'd hope he'd be a bit used to that. 38-6-7 is the score from the judges. So Liam holding off one big challenger there in Enzo Nilo as he takes his spot back in the hot seat. So Liam, it's been quite a journey. In the first event, it didn't really work out. He had a fall, and then he was on the podium mm. in the second event. Now he finds himself in the hot seat. So this kid on an upward trajectory right now in his free ride world tour journey. Yeah, exactly. He's got six more bullets to judge before he can call himself the fastest drawer in the West out here in Kicking Horse. It's time to get bucked. Get bucked indeed. As we head back up to the top, goofy rider Hans Midnick. Brother of former World Tour champion Nils Midnick, and Hans has been, uh, he's had some tough luck so far. Some odd runs, some weird falls. He had an eighth, and then he was fourth in Andorra, so a little bit closer to what he was looking for. Um, hailing from Stowe out east in Vermont, but riding out of Baker right now. He's been a champion at the legendary Mount Baker Bank Slalom. He's got the ultimate board control. Hans Midnick, I think, is looking for a little bit more than what we've seen. I don't think we've seen his full array of riding yet. 29, rookie, a wild card on the tour. He's been around the snowboard scene for a long time, well known in the in the sort of pro shred world, mm. and definitely looking forward to Hans. I think this is gonna suit his riding a lot better. We've seen some tricky conditions at the other events, but powder, that's gotta be Hans' bread and butter. Yeah, and speaking of bread and butter, that goatee is absolutely saucy. A lot better than his brother's thin little excuse for a mustache. And he's going out to zone D, which I'm actually quite excited to see, to see a bit of a spread of different line choice here. Yeah, definitely many options. And so far, we have three riders on the face and opting for three completely different lines. So that's really exciting for us. It's a little bit thin up top here. So the riders, we're going to see them maybe going a little slower than you might expect. But that's, I'd say, the sensible move in this, mm. uh, in this position. Yeah, Lolo from the judges just informing them that they've asked the riders just to take it easy here. They're not going to be uh, judged until they drop into their line properly. 
it is a veritable Discovery Challenge Shark Week as we see. Commentators curse, I'm so sorry. Uh, just dropping the nose under the snow. Probably, yeah, as you said, hooking up on, on a rock there as he is over some serious exposure. Yeah, you can see that is a definite no-fall zone. He's just working his way around. I don't think that fall is going to... I don't want to put words in the mouth. You know, I don't want to put anything in Lolo's mouth. But I don't think that's going to come into it because I think it's now he's on course. All right, well, going for the 180 there and down, unfortunately. So a tough start for the run here for Hans Midnick as he's still making his way through. Going to be looking to uh, to salvage a little bit as he gets into the meat of it. Yeah, just snatching a little bit of tail there as well off that last year, which was a lovely piece of style. And just working his way through these mini Christmas trees, he's shopping for Santa. And coming down over the big dog here at the bottom, Hans is going to have to point it if he doesn't. Oh, and he does right off the top ropes. Clean landing there for Hans Midnick. Oh, look at that turn out the bottom, dropping into the shadows. Really liked the end of that run. <laughs> that is, that is, that is. Fr I'm sure Hans is immensely frustrated by by uh, how that's gone because you could really see how close he was to putting that all together. Oh, his board just came to a dead stop, and you could actually yeah. see in the track there he exposed a rock. And I believe that was a, a 180 off that one there as well. So he's trying to bring the tricks in, trying to bring, bring in a bit of switchery. You can see even the takeoff there, basically negative takeoff with the Sharks uh, basically riding a rock. Yeah, you can see his board ripple and then a great finish as he just connects with the transition at the bottom of that. So fluidity control and technique way down. That's an unfortunate one for Hans Midnick. Mm. Uh, and, and you know, we're, we're, we saw it in face check chatting to the riders. There was a lot of indecision on where to go because they were worried about that exact thing because we're, we're dealing with slightly thinner snowpack and, and with the five centimeters of beautiful champagne powder on top of it now, some of the rocks that you could see before, now you can't. So it's a bit of a roll of the dice going into that more, uh, I guess, more exposed zone because the, the situation with the rock is just a big question mark. Yeah, uh, given the amount of rock exposed at the moment, it could have been a bit better if they'd asked for a, a slightly denser snowfall, you know. I mean, you've got a denser commentator and myself filling in, so maybe if we could have lined those up, it would have been good. So a 34 there for Hans, an unfortunate finish. He's got a piece of tree dangling off his backpack, I think, just to keep his connection with nature. So Hans into the finish, and that is not going to bother Liam Rivera. So another big bullet dodged. And yep. uh, Liam sitting pretty there. Mexican rider in the hot seat, loving it so far today. Yeah, but it's time to spin the barrel and see who's next up in the chamber. Up top, we have one of the big hitters from this season, Jonathan Pimpy. Yeah, John Powell, he lives in Squamish. He is uh, officially riding under an American flag. He's a, uh, well, a scientist, a biochemist, probably, uh, we've been calling him the smartest man on the Freeride World Tour. And uh, also incredibly strong rider. He he had a, a bit of a tough start with a fall, I'd say an uncharacteristic fall in in Bakira, but then came back swinging in Andorra on the podium in second place. He's got a, a, a title on the Bec de Ross in Verbier. Um, Jonathan losing his spot on the tour a couple years ago, going back through the qualifiers in the Challenger Series last year, winning his spot back on tour handily, and then proving at the last event that this is right where he belongs. And they call him John Pow, so I think he's going to be happy on the face today with this nice dusting of powder. Hopefully going to be able to dodge the swarm of sharks we've seen five years on the tour. 35 years old, Jonathan Penfield just getting ready to kick things off. And he's pretty stoked on this, uh, on this conditions, on this run and on this face. Yeah, exactly, a quite unassuming guy. I, I'm a big fan of Jonathan Starr. He just lets his riding do the talking, which is an absolute cliche, but it's a cliche for a reason. That's right, these stereotypes come into play, and as you said, you'll never hear him talking about the cool stuff he does, but if you watch his pillow lines on Instagram, he's always out there getting after it. He's got such a nice, a nice snow touch with his board. You can see kind of just the soft ankles, you know, other riders kind of getting skipped over those wind features, and his board just tracking on the snow. Yeah, you got to have those soft ankles. Uh, I've been no good at that. Mine are absolutely rubbish. <laughs> now he's waking his way down here into that uh, far lookers left side, just popping past a wee, just saying we hi on the on the way past. Let's see where he's going to drop in. Just noticing just how much of a roll away that is from the top of the ridge there. 
Looks like he might be lining up something similar to Liam. Yeah, it's good. You see these riders, he'll, they'll make that heel side turn so they can spot where they are in the corner. So John Pout Ooh. now right into the heart of it. This is a hot start. One way in, no way out. <laughs> Nice little double there, lining up the same air as Liam, going for the front three, sticking it into the powder. Oh, this is looking like the zone that you want to play in. Oh, nice little hippie there, getting the grab as well. Not going back-to-back -back spins, though. Yeah, for sure. The judges are going to notice that air and style, one of the categories that they are looking at. And, uh, and you know, definitely maybe slightly more technical entrance airing onto that first pad that Liam aired off, so adding a little bit of technicality to his line. Um, but the freestyle element for sure coming into play, mm. but a solid run. And, uh, it, you know, just from, from observation at this point, it looks like that looker's right side delivering a slightly better snow quality. Yeah, I think indeed. Look at this here, nice piece of slough in the background, getting the grab there, slashing it up, lining the next one up immediately. Front three, no grab as far as I could see. I wouldn't quite say as stylish as Liam's one. Maybe that uh, takeoff's been a little bit hacked. Getting yet another grab, buzzed by the drone, just laying it down. Very soft, elegant style. Mozart on the mountains. So smooth. I really like that kind of lip smack to... to to cross hill air there for John Powell. So we see the judging criteria, just a nice straight line all the way down, line fluidity control, air and style and technique. Those are the categories the judges are working with mm. and working on that they're gonna be matching the riding to, going through every little detail in the run, comparing it to Liam's run, comparing it to the criteria to drop a score on it. You can see they're getting to work. All of those criteria factor in equally important uh, and definitely John Powell kind of ticking all the boxes. Yeah, suspiciously even across the uh, across the board there with uh, each category. I'm kind of thinking uh, that J Powell has gone a little bit mad scientist, tactician style here. And is just holding a little bit back. He needs a replacement result for that fifth. He's in second now with the 70 points. Which is a really solid score again, but just under Liam. Yeah, and I think that makes sense with what mm. we saw. We saw Liam spinning both ways. Um, uh, maybe a slightly more attacking, kind of aggressive uh, uh, approach to his run. So high five there from John Powell for Liam. John Powell's done his bit, and as you said, he's already got a second in under his belt. So he's 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 sitting pretty uh, with the cut, looking. You know, I think for John Powell, the the focus of the year is always getting to Verbier. That's his favorite by by a mile, and that's where he wants to be sitting in that start gate on top of the Beck de Ross. But we go straight back up. There are no breaks. A kicking horse for the Free Ride World Tour, <laughs> and this man is leading the tour. We saw Ludo Guillaudiat on the tour, off the tour. He'd win back on the qualifiers, then he'd come back on and get cut again. And he's found another gear this year. He's kind of connected with his riding. Seventh season on the tour, and it's been a bit of a roller coaster for him, but he is now sitting in that leader's bib now. Because we're in golden, all the bibs are golden. So we've gone with a platinum bib for our tour leaders so far, and that is Ludo right now. He is the only guy in the snowboard field guaranteed to make it through to finals. Regardless, he could just tomahawk down the mountain. I don't think that's going to be his his strategy, but he could if he wanted to, and he still make finals. Derek Foos, why would you just say that? Y'all don't say that. No time of hooking down the mountain. Look at that lovely toe side turn. I, I think it really shows the heart of the man that he's fought his way back on yet again. He has the skills to be here, and I'm just super excited to see this. This is beautiful riding. Yeah, Ludo. Really throwing up clouds. Ludo taking a charging approach, high speed so far, and in another zone that we haven't seen, you can just see the ski patrol track from earlier this morning doing a little ski cutting, popping over that one. Nice tail ollie. I like to see that. I mean, I think it's critical for the riders on some of those airs to take off early. And now Ludo getting up above this one. And he's working his way down into the gut. A nice air there, setting up for the double. Getting it bolts, pointing it out the bottom. I think that's a pretty damn fine run myself. That was a great run, and in the classic Ludo Guillaudiat style, charging fall line, high speed, really aggressive. And he is, he is stoked. 
I wish my French was a was a lot better than that, but uh, I believe he is saying the uh, elephant ate the orange. Uh, if I am if I am reading this correctly, you see that massive pre ollie to get over the little Christmas trees there. Again, I think we've seen possibly a little bit of a, a tactical response from our current world number one, playing to his strengths with powerful riding, but not potentially taking too much risk, keeping it in the fall line, keeping it fast staying away from the blood circling sharks. Yeah, I think that's really smart. I, I, I really believe that getting your board sideways in the snow today is going to be risky. We saw that take out Enzo um, ca getting caught up, and so Ludo just keeping it pointed the whole way, ah, top to bottom, sure. a different approach. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, Ludo's been known for the big mountain charging style, but in the last event, he brought the freestyle in with a huge backflip. Uh, perfectly executed, so he's got that in. He's got that in the bag, but here opting for the pure free ride approach. It looked fun, uh, but he definitely seems a little grumpy. But I think uh, I think he's going to be feeling a little better when the score drops, as we yes, see the judges yes. take 72-6-7. So Ludo moving into second. So a solid result there. Uh, for our current tour leader. Right now, he's got a third and a first under his belt. Now he's sitting in second with only a few riders to go. Still three men that are all big threats to push Ludo and, honestly, Liam off, uh, off the hot seat and off the podium. Yeah, here at Kicking Horse, anything can happen. As we look at that list of our current standings, Liam Rivera out in front, Ludovic Giordiet and Jonathan Penfield in third. Up next, we have Holden Samuels. Samuel Holden's? Hold Holding <laughs> Samuels's. Holding yeah. sandwiches. Holden has uh, has come onto the tour hot, right out of the gate. He's young, he's a rookie. This is his first year on the Freeride World Tour, and in his first event, he was second right away. Uh, he had a big year on the qualifiers here last year, or sorry, in North America, I should say, last year. And he's kind of got the full package. He's the new generation of freeriders that have the big mountain chops. His board control is second to none, but he's also got the deep freestyle bag. So let's see what Holden Samuels can bring to the ozone face here today. Yeah, pretty baby face there at 23, but obviously with the skills that you would need to get to this point in the tour, staring straight into the heart of the sun, he's making his way to a similar entrance as Ludo. Let's see what he has to say here. Well, the rider's just loving the conditions as he's going up just a touch higher, catching an upper air that we haven't seen anybody hit yet, and now just pinned through the powder. Holden having a great time out there. How is that heel side turn just leaning back into it? Lovely arch. Oh! Speaking of getting arched out, that rock just sent him one. Yeah, just a little too slow on that one, and now pinned with the pre-hop. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> Speaking of full packages, Samuel <laughs> Holden's just got absolutely massive out the bottom. Well, we saw the two ends of the scale there, too slow on the upper one, and then not willing to take the risk of not enough speed on the next one. So just opening the throttle wide and sending that bottom air, and that landing looked perfect. This screenshot did not do that justice. <laughs> Look how far back he took off on yeah, that man. thing. Oh my god, I, I love this heel so turn coming up here. This makes me want to go out and buy a fish board and just go and just never ski again. Oh. Yeah, you, you can, can see coming into this rocky zone there, look how much he has to get right through that little gap and just land square on that pointy one. Yeah, I wonder if that was just a little more uphill than he was expecting. And then, yeah, the way early takeoff for that one, wheeling out of it Ooh. and just getting control back before that clump of trees. So control down for, for Holden Samuels there. Yeah, I just, you know, it was a little uphill there, and it, I think especially um, coming in and losing a bit of speed on the approach, it was hard for him to have the speed to make it. Still going for the acid drop, though, straight to the ups, upside face of that rock. <laughs> acid straight up the side of the face. Absolutely not what you want on a day like this. He's waiting for his score nervously, but I think we can safely say that's probably not going to challenge the top three. So a tough day in the office for Holden Samuels, but he's got many good years ahead of him. He sure does, and he's got already a really, really good result uh, under his belt, so that's going to be fourth so far. So with two riders to go, Liam Rivera guaranteed to be on the podium today as he is sitting in first. The other two still going to be a bit nervous about their spots on the podium, um, but only... A couple more to go. We're going to be back up to the top straight away for back-to-back uh, -back Bakir Barrett winner, Michael Mon. Cody, we miss you, brother. Feel better. It's not the same without you here. Well, shout out there. 
to, uh, to I think that was to Cody Bramwell, as uh, he's been a fixture on the tour, unfortunately suffering a broken ankle in the last event. So hopefully watching the boys throw it down here from a comfy couch somewhere. Michael Mon, second year on tour, started last year with a huge result, winning in Bakir Barrett and backing it up with another win there, and then unfortunately going down in the last event in Andorra. So he's got a, he's basically got a win and a crash so far. So he's going to be looking to dump that crash. And uh, just a big cheer for the rest of the crew up there at the start as Michael Mon kicks his runoff. Yeah, it'll be really interesting to see what kind of approach he takes here uh, tactically. Will it be all-out war, or will he just be holding a little something-something in his back pocket? Yeah, I think so. You know, he's he's uh, he's one of the most technically sound riders on the tour, Goofy Foot. So you can see he's got his uh, his face, his front side to the corner, so he can kind of keep eyes on where he is on the ridge. But he's you know, initially known Ooh. for really technical riding, slashing it with a 360 <laughs> off the corners to kick things off. The judges are going to be loving that. How's the drama of that? Just cuts a little piece of corners, immediately hooks into a 360, and you're just charging beautiful turns down this open face. So getting up into the zone that gave Enzo Nilo some trouble, but now coming down onto the rider's right side. There are a few interesting oh. options that have formed up in here. Getting over top into a double. Oh, and Michael Mon catching up on that landing. Bit of a butt slide down on the rocks. Hopefully he's wearing uh, some padded shorts. Yeah, that looked like a bit of an ass grater, unfortunately, there for Michael Morn. Um, I hope he's okay, but I'm sure he's a tough little cookie. Just making a few turns there. That's a real shame. I'm not sure he would have known that that pocket that he had to ride through released. Hopefully that didn't affect his run. Yeah, as, as, as you could see from the drone shots from the top, it's completely blind down onto the face from where the riders are standing in the start gate. And, uh, you know, that, that double definitely, it was a cool idea. Um, but even just looking at it, this, what an entry into his run, though. Yeah, I think just I love the added drama points of a little corners failure just to really get your heart in your mouth as you pop the three. And another beautiful air up there, just perfect landing but it's down lower in the run where things get a little bit sticky. You can just see his board as he lands, just punching straight through there, over it. Bit of a slide there, sort of a backside turn over the rocks. Not what you want to be doing, not what he was wanting to be doing, I'm sure. Yeah, it's an interesting, uh, an interesting decision for the riders when they get into the air, whether they're going to put the tail down first, expecting soft snow, or land really square over both feet, depending, you know, on what they expect the snow to be, what they think it's going to be, and it, it is a bit of a gamble. And especially in a double stage. With a double stage, you can't be back. If you're back, you are going to get bucked off the next air. So you have to be over the front of your board. And unfortunately, that just stuck. Yeah, punched the nose in and him going over the bars there. So again, we're seeing red in fluidity control and technique as the judges, uh, you know, giving their opinion on basically a fall is going to put you in into the, those, the low side on those categories. Yeah, unsurprisingly, a fall will knock your points off. Thanks. Derek, that's a really great point you've made there. But the interesting thing here is that this is really opening the door. This is going to be a big shuffle, I think, in terms of the overall rankings. We see 42 points there for Michael Morn. And we have one rider to go, who probably the rider who needs the big result the most. Yeah, and he's definitely seen the rest of the field do all the things that he needed to happen in order for him to step up and over that cut line as Liam and Michael just kind of catching up on their, on their experiences. Hey, guys. Yeah, Kimi Oman might have cast a little bit of a dark spell out there on this day in kicking horse British Columbia. This has been a few men uh, taken asunder by the shark circling with one rider to go in the snowboard men's division. It is still all up for grabs. Yeah, so Ludo, uh, Liam, and John Powell, so far the only riders clean. As we see here, Kami Armand, two years on the tour. He was, uh, well, the last time we were here, he won. So he's definitely got a good track record. This is a happy hunting ground for Kami Armand. This year been a bit of an unexpected uh, drop for him down the rankings, but it is still possible for Kami. Backflips mm. are his specialty. Uh, I, he had he had that crazy fall and definitely struggling with uh, with a bit of an injury. He was very sore after that scorpion in in Andorra, but seeming to, to be coming back firing. Hopefully he's all juiced up on adrenaline now. 
Yeah, speaking of Juiced Up, just giving a little bit of a vocal call out there. He's dropping in, riding regular down the ridge to the rider's right. One of my favorite riders to watch on this tour. I, I feel like he's one of those real surprise packages. You never really know what's going to happen, where the explosive moment's going to come. I can't wait to see how this unfolds. This is like really exciting finish to this division. Yeah, you couldn't ask for, you couldn't script a better show here. For Cami Armand looking for a big result. The snow is fantastic. He's heading out to the rider's right where we've seen riders having a great experience. Snow conditions, not so sharky. Cami just slashing <laughs> a couple of the uh, of the ski women as they're hiking up onto, uh, to get to the start gate. Going all the way down, passing the rest of the crew. Way riders right, dropping in here. We've seen one forerunner and one rider down there taking a different approach though. Beautiful turns there. He's coming in with more speed to this here. We've seen some good. Oh, and there it is, the back flip and the front flip. Oh, Cami Armand just getting caught up in the pow on the landing, laying that back flip out, and unfortunately not able to hold on to it. Mm. I wonder. It's been a while since we've had powder at a free ride world tour event. It seems like it's taken some of the riders by surprise. Yeah, to all those climate change deniers out there, it's definitely affecting our world tour. It's probably a bigger problem than you guys have really let us uh, let us believe. Kevin Oman just bringing in the multiple flips there. Unfortunately, I'm pretty sure he only wanted one of them, despite his immense acrobatic ability. And you can really see the disappointment. All jokes aside, like I feel for him, that's... The intent was there. Yeah, great start here, Kami, airing out off the side of that. And then this heel side slash just looking so nice. Setting the flip. Just digging that nose. I hope he's all right, because there was definitely a fair bit of pepper in there, just salt baiting himself down the field. All right, well, as Cami Armand makes his wow. way towards the, the finish area, or into the finish corral, uh, definitely looking a bit dejected, as that was not what he was looking for today. Cami needed a big result to keep himself on the Free Ride World Tour. So that is going to solidify our results in the snowboard, man, as uh, a little bit of... This is, this is kind of the, the contrast of free ride competition, glory and heartbreak all in one shot. It really is. This is this is the bit of the tour I hated the most. You know, this is the time where you say goodbye to people. I mean, you, you hopefully see them again, but sometimes you don't. Like, And 29 points for Kemi Armand. So this is not his year, unfortunately. But I hope we see him back. We know he's got the talent to do it here. So dropping in to see the event scoreboard now that we've concluded the men's snowboard. So big hugs there for the two competitors as we take a look at what the day gave us. Mexican rider Liam Rivera, rookie, crash, podium, win. What a ride he has been on. Ludo Guillaudiat backing himself up in that platinum bib and John Pau as well. So we, I mean, as you said, big shuffle. Holden Samuels sliding into first and then uh, Enzo, Hans Midnick and Kami Armand rounding it out. Yeah, exactly. A huge shuffle. But I think the thing to me, aside from the rookie, Liam Rivera's massive result, is Ludo Guillaudia really chucking a stranglehold on that top spot? Yeah, I, that was that was really solid riding. As we said, we saw him go just pure free ride there, mm. where the, most of the other riders were adding some of those elements of freestyle into their ride. And Liam Rivera with the back-to-back -back spinning in different directions. And, uh, well, the judges loving it. Hopefully you guys at home loving it too. I know the Liam Rivera fans out there are going to be loving it. So let's see what this has done to the rankings. Oh. Wow, that is a massive reorganization. So we'll start at the bottom there. We have those riders qualified for the finals with Michael Morn sneaking in in fifth position. Yeah, Holden Samuels, the rookie, getting his spot into finals. John Powell, the uh, the veteran, finding himself now in the top three. Liam Rivera, the young Mexican rookie, sitting second overall. And Ludo Guillaudiat now sitting on top of the rankings. Spectacular day for snowboard men. What a great start. We're going to go down. This is our unofficial podium situation right now with Liam Rivera taking the win. Ludo and, uh, and John Powell backing him up. Sitting together on the podium, all smiles there. And yeah, as we say, the contrast for the ride.
riders who are unfortunately going to be leaving us now for the rest of the year, but they do earn a spot directly onto the Free Ride World Tour Challenger Tour where they can battle their way back onto the FWT this year. Yes, yeah, so and now we have a bit of a reorganization of how it works with the Challenger Series. We take the best from the Qualify Series and those bumped from the Free Ride World Tour and set them head to head. All right, well, let's go down to the finish with our kicking horse Golden BC champion, Liam Rivera. What a ride it's been for your first year on the tour podium last time, and with a win now, how are you feeling right now? I don't know, man. It's, I don't think I believe it yet. I just wanted to make sure that I passed the card, and fuck. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I don't know. <laughs> it's just happy, yeah. <laughs> All right, well, Liam, you did it. You passed the cut, you won the event, and you solidified your ticket into the Freeride World Tour Finals. First Mexican rider on the tour, first Mexican rider on the podium, and now the first Mexican winner of a Freeride World Tour event. Huge congratulations to Liam Rivera. What a way to kick off the day. Thank you so much. Fucking stoked. <laughs> All right, well, snowboard men lighting the candle here at Kicking Horse, getting us started with a bang and a huge result there for the young rider. And we are going to be moving on to Ski Men coming up next. We are back in our next category, kicking out of the start gate here at Kicking Horse Golden BC is going to be ski men and fireworks expected as we just saw from snowboard men. Let's take a little bit of a look at where we're sitting in the overall. Right now, the battle of the Max is heating up. Maxime Chablot, Max Hitzig, and Max Palm all within less than a thousand points of each other at the top three. Valley Rainer there with a huge result and his first win on the Free Ride World Tour. And as we move down, we see the cut line sitting right underneath California's Xander Gouldman. So Jack Nichols, the man on the outside looking in right now, but very, very close scores all the way down to Raina Barkeret. So all still to play for here. And you know, we've got a bunch. And then as we see the bottom ranked man, Christopher Turdell, unfortunately not able to make it. He got really sick. He wasn't able to fly. So Turdell, <coughs> sitting this one out, which is really unfortunate as this has been a real happy hunting ground for Tertel. He's got a few wins and podiums out here uh, at Kicking Horse. So we'll see who's dropping and when here and who's got to do what. So here we have the start list. We have uh, New Zealand's finest, Jamesa Bubbles Hampton, kicking things off, dropping down to Jedediah Kravitz. We've got some big names in this opening, some really explosive riders, Valentin Rayner, Marcus Gogan, and into the back half of the list, we have the champs, the Maxes. We have Andrew Pollard, always a fine figure to watch in such a face. Yeah, A-Paul's been skiing nothing but POW in Alta, so he's going to be happy to see some soft snow conditions on the face. And then the final rider of the day, Ross <laughs> Tester, I think we're going to be uh, anxiously sitting on the edges of our seats as all the way through this ski men start list is just packed with talent yeah. and packed with serious, serious podium threats. Yeah, I like how they gave Ross his own page. Like That's how much <laughs> airtime Ross likes to get in this. He's just out there in the ozone, we're at ozone, let's punch some holes in that ozone layer. Oh yeah, Ross is fired up, and he, you know, it was one, another one who had a tough start, but came back swinging um, with a spectacular run in 
Andorra, which you, essentially we've really come to expect from Ross. So we're going to take a look at what you think is going to happen today with the Peak Performance Fun Bet predictions. No surprises there. Two maxes and a testy. Ross Tester, sorry. 62% uh, for Max, 55 for Maxime, and 35 for Ross. I'm surprised. I kind of, you know, call me biased, call me candy. Uh, I would have thought we'd see Craig Murray, one-time winner, one-time third-place taker on this face in there. Yeah, Craig Murray, uh, an uncharacteristic season on the tour. He hasn't put one down yet to to the feet, but you cannot count him out. One of the best riders on the tour, and and that perfect blend for free ride of, of incredible skiing skills, the charging mentality, and such a deep bag of tricks. I mean, there's there's just there's nobody on this start list that's not capable of winning here today if things go their way. Um, every single rider on on well, from top to bottom, is is completely ready to go, ready to put their stamp on the ozone face, loving the powder. We're going to see, I think we're going to see a lot of big features. We're going to see some tricks go down. Everybody is fired up. The little bit of new snow just doing wonders for the riders' mentality. Everybody pretty stoked to get things going here for ski men. Yeah, one of the things I've loved about this face in the past is kind of that that combo style skiing we've seen from people like Marcus Sita, just barely even staying on the ground, airing from one thing, cranking one turn, cutting across in the start gate. We have the man that's gonna take us into this division, Jamesa Bubbles Hampton from the MSV, MFC in Canterbury. I bet there's a whole bunch of very excited people in New Zealand watching this. Fun fact actually, this uh, broadcast started at 4.20 in New Zealand this morning. Uh, no surprises there, it's starting with the Kiwi. Yeah, so the Kiwis are getting behind Jamesa right now. Uh, he's sitting on a grip of 17th, so he definitely wants more if he wins. He's guaranteed anything in the top five is good for Jamesa to get into the cut. And he's going to kick things off for the ski men's category. No surprise, going out to the rider's right where we've seen the snowboarders deliver some magic already this morning. Yeah, Jamesa the Magic Man is really going to have to pull some tricks out of the bag here. He's got a beautiful uh, cork three on him. So let's see if he unleashes that little beast as he comes down to the start of his line. Going towards his uh, compatriot uh, Craig Murray zone there as well. Let's see who he's going to get his teeth into. To be honest, I'd probably keep my teeth uh, in my mouth. Uh, it's quite cold out there today. Minus 12 with a fair bit of, uh, fair bit of cold. So he's gone even past it right the way to the end. We've seen some good times here. Yeah, fo following Camille Armand's track. Just getting bucked out of the track a little bit low. I don't think that was the plan for Jamesa getting onto that right foot, but the old track kind of kicking him out of it. As going for the channel gap there. Oh! And just a touch short, I think the inability to get off that other feature. Wow. Oh. Jamesa Hampton has literally plowed into what looks like the side of a highway of rock. I hope he's all right. I think he's definitely lost his shoe. Yeah, Ski not interested in staying in the game there. As you can see by his track, the, the coming up short on that channel gap diff gave Jamesa just a wall of rock to plow into. So he's got one ski there for sure. I think the other one a little bit higher up on the face as he unleashed a, a ton of slough in that section. Oh, mate, my heart goes out to him. That is absolutely not what he was trying to do. I can 100% guarantee that, and I never do that. But that is the variability of free ride comps with soft snow. You can see he's just been pushed off his line by that previous track. Here he gets plowed. Jamesa, Mr. Plough Hampton, unfortunately just really not having the season he wanted. No, just way too slow on that one and unfortunately catching the upside and, and that rock just not covered up. And then a ton of slough taking, taking Jamesa mm. down for a bit of a roller coaster ride. Hopefully he's going to be able to find that ski. It's probably buried under the slough cone now somewhere. Oh, we can see it. Thank you to our drone pilot finding wow. the ski for Jamesa. It is wedged in there. That thing is stuffed into its elbow completely I don't know if they're going to be able to get up to that. That looks horrible climbing. Yeah, that's going to be tricky, all the for the, there. tricky for the ski runner even to get down to. So Jamesa just uh, ditching the ski is going to take the rest of the way down on one ski, and uh, we'll get some, some intrepid ski runner down there to dig that thing out of its pit of despair. Yeah, I, I, I'm looking back up at this line, and I, ju I just think he's been pushed off his line right from that very first turn after that first year. And I think he was actually probably just freestyling from then on, completely offline. And uh, that's that's just it's just you just hate to see it. 
Yeah, there's just no way with the speed he had that he could get over that. I think I think that is still possible if you have the pace off the first air that Jamesa was trying to get to, to make it over that channel. It's the first time I've ever seen somebody try to gap that channel. Um, you know, we've got the famous channel channel gap on the Vilti loader in Fieberbrunn, but now we have an ozone channel gap coming into play. Uh, unfortunately, taking a prisoner there in Jamesa Hampton, not able to clear the vertical rock wall. As we can see, his ski just chilling there and the mountainside, the early morning sunshine. I wonder if we uh, down the line just like hang a little like a mini long line under these drones and just like with a magnet, you know, and just like pluck them, you know. I think I think that sounds like a good idea. It'd have to be a pretty firm magnet, but I'm sure he's got a big sheet of metal on the top sheet of his skis. It's most mm. of these riders skiing very stiff skis for the Free Ride World Tour. So Jamesa Hampton into the finish line. He's got a big grin. Looks like he's all right, which I'm really happy to see. As that was a tough one. Yeah, it's great to see Jamissa still smiling. He's a beautiful man, he's a beautiful soul, and I really hope we're going to see him back. He's, he's got a great skill set there, but that is unfortunately competition free ride. Glory one day, heartbreak the next. Yeah, so Jamesa will uh, be guaranteed a spot on the Freeride World Tour Challenger Tour and be able to uh, earn his way back should he so choose. I mean, riders, you know, looking looking to basically make a decision pretty rapidly if they don't make the cut into Freeride World Tour Finals. Some of them are going to go on, some of them are going to do other stuff. But we are, uh, we are back towards the start gate. We'll see uh, the next man in the gate is going to be Jed Kravitz riding out of Truckee, California. Jed Kravitz having his way with the Challenger Tour last year. First overall, 34 years old, rookie on the Tour. He's a realtor in his spare time when he's not sending huge cliffs on the mountain. And Jed Kravitz looking for a solid result here too as he has, he's had a bit of a tough start on his Freeride World Tank Tour mm. campaign, 19th and 16th so far. Jed Kravitz kicking off his day here at Golden Kicking Horse, BC. Yeah, Jed Kravitz, he can tell me anything really. I just want to put a steering wheel on him and take him home. Coming down the ridge there. Interestingly enough, I still believe we have a ski in the face, but I imagine they're probably cleared that he's not gone quite as far down the ridge. So it's good to keep things rolling here. I think there's going to be a lot of emotion on the line for uh, Jed here as he works his way down the ridge. He's got all to play for. Yeah, such a happy guy. He's always just stoked to be out here with the crew. And uh, if you haven't checked out his multi-part film project, Ski for the Love, it's definitely worth a watch. And uh, pretty much sums up Ooh. his style. So Jed getting right into the guts of it here off the top. Beautifully finding that transition there and then getting the kind of... Oh, and the big punch front there. So the snow conditions just a little bit variable for a lot of these riders, finding deep pockets. The wind has kind of moved things around a little bit, and riders just seeming to be a little unsure of what the landing surface they're going to be dealing with is like. Yeah, it's interesting. Talking to a lot of riders, a lot of them were really eyeing up this uh, side of the venue because it looks like it has better snow. But one of the things you do have to deal with is that cross-loading. It is going to have almost more variability uh, to be found. And, like, more snow is great, but... Not if there's a pile of it, like it just ripped the feet out from under Jed Kravitz there. Yeah. I was going to say clamp it, but that's, that's the wrong one. Uh, it's, you hate to see that. Yeah, not what Jed was looking for up there. So a really strong start into that freestyle zone. I love the way he entered this section, just popping right off the top of that. Perfect connection back with the snow. And then here's where it went sideways for him. I feel like he got a little bit kicked even by that takeoff. You can see him wind the windows down. I mean, just beautifully done here. Precision skiing and right there. You see him get kicked in the back seat a little bit. He lands and it's kind of like a double spine where the snow has been sloughing down there. It can kind of create these cones. And the, and the sort of density of those can be very different and just totally take your feet. Yeah, and that wind feature that was the takeoff of his second air, I think a little bit more abrupt, as you said. So once you're out of balance to the back, then you try to reconnect with the front and slightly over overdoing it there. So Jed yeah. Kravitz, 36, 6, 7. Uh, well, it, good to see him like wearing that well on his chin. I mean, it is a magnificent chin as well. It so is. he slides into the hot seat. <laughs> yeah, from a man with a magnificent, a magnificent chin himself, that is high praise for Jed Kravitz. So he's going to take the spot in the Dynastar hot seat there, and we take a look at the big picture of the ozone face. Lots of options. We're heading back up to the start gate for our next rider in the ski men's category. This man highly decorated. He's an Olympian 
in slope style. He's got the deepest bag of tricks possibly in the entire uh, in the entire field. Maybe uh, maybe on par with young Finn Billis. Ralph Valpener, the Italian rider, he's ready to go. He's been all over the place. I mean, you've seen him in the Olympics. You've seen him in the X Games. He's he's just got such a great pedigree for mm. skiing, and he's been loving his time on the Freeride World Tour. Yeah, speaking of decorated, what a nice tattoo that young man had on his face. A completely different style and background to a lot of these riders here, but that's what makes free ride so great at the moment, I think. There is a real kind of shift of the guard. There's a lot of these younger guys coming in and kind of trying to make it their own. And exactly, he just pops 180, cab one back, bouncing around, just really playing with that terrain. I mean, is this the is this the progression of freestyle skiing or freeride skiing? It's kind of up to these guys to set that, and that's what's so fun about it, I think. Yeah, and it's such a diverse group of riders that you've got, you know, pure free riders, you've got the freestylers. So Ralph popping in here with a nice playful slash, getting down on top of this cliff that we saw some of the snowboarders loving, and a clean entry so far for Ralph Velpener. Oh, he's building speed. Monster left 360, struggling a little to hold on to that landing, but you could see him like skipping that fish and just building speed. You're like, this man's gonna tell me something. Yeah, he was going there, and you could see him fighting to regain balance after the landing. The snow just kind of catching one ski, then catching the other. But Ralph Velpener kicking things off with a bang. We saw a very similar line in uh, years past from Tanner Hall, and I'd say similar kind of pedigree. So that's the one that really sucks in mm. those pure freestyle riders. And Ralph looking like having a great time up there. I love just seeing this, just playing along. I'd be, I'd be way too terrified. Like, yes, I could do that, but in a competition run? Hell no. Lining this one up, kind of traditional style off the bat. Drone struggling to keep up with him and then just sets this three. Look at that little early takeoff. Kind of a little cat-like maneuver in the air to get it round and get it centered. Struggling a little bit with the hand down. So we'll call that probably about a, about a stage two, would you say, landing. Yeah, something along those lines. We'll leave that one in the judging tent. But the uh, the the line and fluidity really high. Aaron Style obviously maxing a little ding in control there from the video judge. As we saw, Ralph really fighting to get it back. He didn't go down though, and that's a testament to his cat-like wow. ability to rebalance. Wow, so the judges definitely got their work cut out for them on that one. Ralph Velpener, he's going to be stoked to have put down a run because he's been struggling in the in the early ones. He had a tough fall in Andorra, but that was a good one for Ralph and that's going to be a highlight reel for years to come. Yeah I can confidently say that will be Ralph's uh, best result so far this season. Does need a lot of ground to make, does need to make up a lot of ground to uh, make it through the cut though but great to see a real sort of shift in that style and just putting it to his feet in the end. Yeah, and I love the commitment to the speed into that lift, and especially being the first guy <laughs> off it. So big horns for the crew at home watching Ralph Velpener throwing it down here. And yeah, just, just full commitment into that. When you're the first rider off a lift like that, and you don't exactly know what the snow conditions. Yep. So 53, 6, 7 there for Ralph Velpener. Uh, the speed you need, a little bit of a question mark. He's done a great service for the riders to come behind him by putting that track in. Yeah, looking just uh, out live, you know, not on the screen. Sometimes I like to look at the mountains in real life. You can see just how far he has tracked across the hill with that. But I actually think there's scope now that the track's in for riders to go even further, further skiers left, further down the pitch. But yeah. Ralph's making himself uh, comfy in that hot seat for now. But who's going to try and take it from him? I think so too. So our next rider in the gate is the uh, most recent man with a win on the Free Ride World Tour. The Austrian rider doing it for Scott, riding for peak performance, Valentin Rayner. He's had uh, he had a season he had a rookie season on the tour last year. Didn't quite make the cut, but battled back through the Challenger Tour and found his way back now. And he's sitting pretty way high up in the rankings, fourth overall, and one of only four men guaranteed through the cut. So he's going to be feeling fairly comfortable. But I think we're not going to see any relief off the gas pedal from Valley Rayner as now he's got a bit of confidence from a win. I think we're going to see Valley Rayner coming out uh, firing. Yeah, I think so. I mean, with, with the pressure off, there is all to gain here, you know. This pretty Valentine, I think, is going to absolutely put his foot through the floor. Yeah, and, and just... Uh He's got such a fun style to watch. It's a nice blend of smooth skiing, but with a whole bag of freestyle. Opening it up right into Michael Mons' Cornice Debris with a 360, and straight off this lower one, Valley Rayner getting things started. Be interesting to see where he takes this now. He's moving a back skier's left. 
There's some fairly scrubby looking bits. He sneaks his way through there. Side hill transfer, a big air and stomp. I like that combo. That's really technical and going huge with a backflip out the bottom and what? Oh, Valley Rainer stomping. We've seen that one used as an extra credit cliff from the side, but taking it right off the top with a backflip and a perfect landing. So Valley Rainer backing things up after his last win. This is a whole new Valley. Once a wolf gets a taste of blood, they are gonna want it over and over. And for Valley Rainer, look at his face. He is absolutely pumped. That's gonna be a lovely GoPro angle of his knees. But what I love about that run is that he's really put it all on the line by cutting through a super technical section to get that big air. If he missed that, the rest of his run was gone. Yeah, there was no other way out of there. And he had that big double on the approach, which the, the judges are going to love, kind of bringing the, the combo now of the true big mountain and then the freestyle element with a 360 at the top in this one. That is not an easy takeoff for a backflip, and he is absolutely humming like a choir boy off there. Wow. I can't believe he, how clean he stomps that with that takeoff. Like, yeah. It's kind of a lazy boy. You see him throw the feet and kind of pause a bit and then go for the flip. So no section of that run lacking for features, lacking for action, and lacking for energy. So score Whoa. coming in for Valley at 86-3-3, and he is going to take a spot in the hot seat there. What a way yep, to get things good. going for Valley Rayner. Peak performance rider absolutely lighting the wick on this dynamite stick here at Kicking Horse. Yeah, driving like an absolute Mercedes-Benz man there with absolute disregard for those around him. 86 is a huge score, but I think it's well warranted. I love that. Oh, yeah. Valley Rayner now sitting comfortably in the hot seat, but he's not going to be too comfortable as the the start list just keeps on delivering <laughs> big guns, big dogs, and plenty of podium contenders. We head back up to this young gun, given a wild card for Andorra and delivering one of the wildest cards we've ever seen on the Freeride World Tour. 18 years old, out of the Whistler Freeride Club, Marcus Gogan. I know the whole Whistler Freeride Club coaches crew gathered together to watch, uh, watch this young buck shred. He's looking for a solid result here. He's got a ninth, but he's not holding a second result. So definitely looking to get things going here for young Marcus Gogan. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see if it's uh, all out here for Go Go Gogan or if he's going to hold a little bit back. I would say it's pretty hard to surprise this bitter old fool, but that 720, that just blew my mind. Like huge side hill, step over, transfer air, and just cranking a cork seven off it. Like I just was like, where is this going? What has happened to the sport? I just... I can't keep up anymore. Well, we saw in the highlight video, Ross Tester, who was in the hot seat, looking at Marcus as he came through the finish, going, well, that's the future. Oosh. Jesus. Sorry. <laughs> so Marcus just trying to find his landmarks for entry as he comes into this one. And a big 360. Clean. Is he going to be able to hold on? Marcus Gogan, a quick redirect into the backflip. Marcus Gogan, clean. Unbelievable for this young rider. Back to back to back. And heading over now to this low line. Oh. <laughs> I feel like we're watching like a actually well-made version of Johnny Mosley's PlayStation game where you could just do whatever you want of whatever you want. This is just silly. He barely touched the ground and just bounced ears and tricks off everything. Well, I'm like flying, I'm like, I've got my arms all over the shot, I'm like one of those wacky, wavy, inflatable tube men. I'm just blown away. The fastest go? run we've seen by far. There were no breaks, barely any time to get his feet underneath him. Look at this entry, so exposed, fracturing the corners, 360 in, it couldn't be crazier. Finding his balance there, quick redirect and the flip. I just love, while he's obviously got a really great bag of trips, just how hard he had to fight to get that bottom ski down, to get that turn and to get to that backflip. That to me is just super critical maneuver skiing. We're seeing that technique, you know, that man knows how to turn a ski as well as bust a move. Yeah, and he didn't get into Ralph Elpiner's track there. So busting a clean track off that takeoff, he had to set that backflip so hard. His feet were under the snow when he set it. Let's see if we can this hear what- Really, really interesting. Is, uh, this, I think, is a really big moment of this division right here, right now. Let's listen in. 
Uh, it's pretty good snow though, eh? Yeah. Sick. Damn, awesome. Yeah. Oh! Yeah. Strange visual maneuver there. He nervously waits. So here we go. Score coming in for Marcus Gogan. It's a 92. A 92. This 18-year-old. The path he's been on. World wow. Junior Champion like three weeks ago. Tossed a wild card. Delivers fireworks in Andorra. And now he is in the hot seat at the free ride. <laughs> the only thing I'm disappointed about is re his reaction. He's like, oh, yep, fair enough. I kind of thought that was a 94, but sure, I'll take 92. <laughs> God, it's been a tough day in the office out here. It's hard to impress these guys. Wow. wow. Oh. Go, go, Gogan, just getting it done. Unbelievable run for the young Whistler athlete. And uh, <laughs> I mean, we saw the potential in Andorra, and now we've seen a full run for Marcus Gogan. He needs to be in the top 10 to move into finals. Well, He's definitely he done, done his bit for that. But we don't have a, even a moment of rest here at Kicking Horse Golden BC. We go straight back up to the top. Finn Billis, another rider bringing freestyle into free ride. He's an Olympian. He's got a huge pedigree. In in the freestyle world, but growing up, you know, the younger brother of uh, a freeride world tour standout, Hank Billis. Finn, freeride a huge part of his life as well. Yeah, that's the thing, like known for his freestyle, but I've seen this guy ripping around the fields of Triple Cone all his life since he was a snot-eating little grommet. Little Tinny, as he's known across New Zealand for a variety of reasons, I don't actually know. No one will tell me. Nose butter right off the bat there. Just known for bringing an incredibly playful design, but he's also got a really solid pair of feet under him. Yeah, and Finn coming in with a bit of charge here. You can see he's got his foot on the pedal as he's going to catch the side of this one and get into a super technical zone behind the trees. <laughs> I'm sure that was fine, probably fine. That was very confusing. Stepping over a triple and now coming into this what? massive air with a 360 oh! Finn Billis. Man, this division has gone <laughs> off right now. Uh, the opening moves were a bit strange, but... This has been a real surprise package. That's not what I expected to see so much. Wow. Well, Finn Billis, I mean, he's been listening to the judges. You know, in the first event, he went pure freestyle and maybe not as high-paced mm. as, as the judges want to see in a freeride competition. Yeah. Finn is a student of the sport, and he was listening well. Yeah. Full charge, all fall line, and a gigantic 360 at the bottom. Ooh. This piece just boggled me. Now I've got a better angle, and you can see he did have room to sneak behind that tree section there. But he's basically just airing so crosshill semi-constantly into this huge right 360. Look how much he had to clear there and just in the landing. Yeah, that couldn't have been more perfect as Kicking Horse just delivering. I think one of the great things about the Ozone venue, not really a lot of flat landings here. So the riders loving the connection back with the ground on these big airs. As you can see, just seamless there for Finn out of that 360 right to bolts and shredding out underneath. Mm. Also nice to see he's sponsored by Peace. I didn't know that was a thing you get sponsored by, but all for that. Uh, big, uh, big, big, just big to see him listening. I think little, maybe a little mama Emma Billis has been in his ear, like giving a little box around the ears, being like, hey, you can ski fast. Maybe stop dancing so much and, you know, get a little rowdy. Finn rowdy, Billis. rowdy, rowdy. Finn Billis delivering. Right now he has... Uh, well, he has a couple solid results, sitting ninth and fifth and eighth overall, so well within the cut line. As uh, oh, definitely, too, we yeah, want to see Marcus. Finn back in Fever Burn. He was a wild card there and delivering one of the moments of the year with that perfect blunt cork seven. And Finn Billis now, the judges have their work cut out for them. I mean, we're only six guys into the field, and we're already scores in the high 80s and 90s. So Finn Billis is going to be looking to slot in there somewhere, hopefully up nice and high. I think really Marcus and Valley, the only super clean runs so far. So I think we're going to be looking at somewhere in that top three range for Finn as the judges uh, lock in their scores. Yeah, speaking of slots, Finn really gambling on the slot machine there of that cross hill section of just multiple ears. And Again, if he hadn't got to that final year, he wouldn't have much. 83 points. That's a very solid nice score in this field. 83 for Finn. So sliding into third. Valley Rayner sitting in second right now. And young Marcus Gogan in first. This is just heated up. Oh, man. What a show we're getting here at Kicking Horse. We've been talking for a while. The last few events where the snow has just Thank been a little you. bit challenging for the riders 
about what we're going to see when we do finally get powder. Well, this is it. These riders mm. have been hungry for this, and this next man, no different. Jack Nichols riding out of Vail, Colorado. A couple seasons on the tour, sitting in 15th right now in a, a big crew of guys sitting around that 7,000 point mark, all going to be looking to bump just up. He's one below the cut before the comp, so Jack Nichols going to be looking to make a big splash. He's got a big bag of tricks yep. and great turns on him, and pretty much every time we see him push out of the gate, it is 100 miles an hour. Yeah, Jack Nichols told me he loved watching me ski when he was growing up, which made me feel nice for a second and then really old for a lot longer. But I love this guy skiing. It is a real range. He's got a big set of travel on him. Look at those pins. You could chuck him in a pair of heels up on stage and you'd get a great show. And I'm pretty sure that's what we're about to see right now. Yeah, tall drink of water. Been uh, <laughs> on the tour with his brother, uh, who we, you know, we're definitely missing the, the Kev Nichols spirit. Hopefully he's at home cheering Jack on. And Jack Nichols getting, getting set to kick things off with a bang. Some really interesting tricks. He's got that sort of side flip Lincoln loop on lock. I'm really hoping we're going to see it because it's kind of become his trademark. Oh, 360 <laughs> with the corners and still holding on to it. So Jack Nichols getting his heart rate up right at the start. The cinematic value of smashing corners is off while doing a trick, I think has been underrated in judges criteria up till this point. Taking that same double we saw from Valentin, so silky through there. Jeez, you could run a hand across that. Oh, that's perfect. And he's going to come in slightly lower with a big backflip, Jack. Oh! oh. Just a, maybe a little short on clearing, getting on the good side of that slough cone. The difference in angle from Valley was really not huge, but the difference in landing well, that's just how precise you have to be on the space. A really good angle of it there. You can see the stomp landing to your look is right. And you can see Jack kind of catching just more of that slough cone cross hill side bank, which is just, I mean, surfers love talking about banks. This is the bank you don't want. This is the bank in your face. Yeah, this is the bank asking for the house back after you've worked all your life to get it. Jack, unfortunately, kicking a shoe in the process. Yeah, just too flat. So Jack Nichols with such a spectacular start to his run. <laughs> this is just brilliant. I love this. I mean, obviously a little squirrely in the air, but like working super well to get that round. But I loved this. This for me is just look how smooth he is. Jeez, that's Gillette. Yeah, we saw we saw Valley take that one, kind of skiing over the tussock. Huge backflip, just carrying a little further. Actually, we saw him sail over the bomb hole of Valley Rainer. No, I think actually he's. Isn't that Billy out there? Oh yeah. Wow. Just. Yeah. I loved that run. That is a real shame for Jack Nichols, and with the cut happening today, that is not what he was wanting. But. Man, I love that skiing. That is exactly what I was expecting to see from this young man. And I really do hope he goes back to the challenges and puts his heart into it because that was really impressive. That to me is a beautiful blend of power skiing and trickery. Not just skiing to features and doing something off, but putting the foot down. I loved that. Yeah, super strong riding from Jack Nichols. So he's going to have to regroup after that one as we move. On down the start list here at Kicking Horse Golden BC, delivering everything we hoped it would. And Raina Barkrid, the mayor of Stomptown, 20 years at, of, of competitive free ride, never mind, uh, you know, skiing at all. 20 years, 40 years old, 14 seasons on the tour, and still evolving with the kids. We saw him redeem himself. He had a, a slightly over rotated backflip in the first comp, and then perfect in the last one. Raina Barkrid, Always one to watch. Yeah, Ronnie Barker has been on the tour so long. It was originally filmed in black and white. One of the big regrets I have about commentating today is not actually being in the start gate with him. I loved competing with this guy. He's a massive analyst of the sport, super well-spoken and thought member of this community, and also a great leader for the younger ones, making sure the riders are being looked after and their best interests are being respected by the organization as they do. Ryan Barker has been a true leader. I mean, what's going to happen to Stomptown after the mayor leaves? Yeah, they're going to have to elect a new one, I guess. Is there going to be some kind of, like, vote? All right, so Ryan going into this zone, popping off there, that landing delivering, and really clean off that. Ooh. Ryan Barker explosive and get in the side hill. That one's proven yeah. really tricky to get to after that cross hill air. So far, really only Marcus Gogan getting onto the right foot quick enough. So Ryan Barker are now carrying speed across to this side hill extra credit feature at the bottom. And you can see by the body language there, 
Reiner kind of knowing the experienced campaigner that he is, that he's missed that. That again to me is just an example of the really exacting precision you need at the moment with these conditions, with this venue. He was just a bit further skiers right on that transfer and that made him just a bit later to get that right foot down. He misses the critical backflip here. I knew that's, that was that's unfortunate. Tricky. I really hope we see this guy in Verve. Like, I'm, I'm putting the call out now. Like you need, can you have the Verve extreme without this man? Like this is, he's I think the greatest competitor on that face. Yeah, absolutely. And this one, you can see it in just the way it kicks. And he just took that extra second to find balance, and that was the second required to get on the right foot and get over there. A strong line for Reina. Still getting a piece of it, which is solid, and finding the good side of that landing really clean there, and then finding himself a little low for the bottom one but still a solid solid run for Raina Barkrid and with the, you know the combination of, of crashes and control issues that we've seen it you know it's it's still going to be probably something for Raina. <laughs> well that's really great Darren glad you think it's going to be something it would be very very strange if it was nothing. 65 for Raina Barkrid so into fourth so far just about halfway through the field so not quite what he was looking for but Raina Barkrid He's done, as you said, he's the number one advocate for the riders on the tour. Mm. He's been on the on the professional free riders board for pretty much the whole time it's existed. So just as you said, I mean, he's he is the ultimate advocate for the riders for making sure everything comes together for everyone. Well, the pace is just non-stop as we move back up. Abel Moga, Spanish rider, every single time he pushes out of the start gate, you just sit on the edge of your seat, known for unexpected action. Abel Moga, he's only it, it's his second year on the tour. It feels like he's been around forever because every time we see him go, he just delivers far more than you could ever imagine. He has uh, kind of taken on the mantle for the Team Spain as uh, after the retirement of Imar Navarro and Abel Moga getting things kicked off now. Yeah, I think uh, it was really great to see Imar Navarro like promoting Abel Moga to, to the World Tour. This guy's got a great style, really aggressive, very creative eye for lines, which uh, obviously Imar is known for. But this, man, this is a man in his own right, and I'm very excited to see where he takes us on this technical face. And exactly, oh, jeez. Oh, hooking up on rock, but somehow managing to stay on his feet like a cat out of a bag. And now coming into this lower section that we saw pay off for many other riders and just a little bit short there for Abel Moga losing his ski. You can see even in the bomb hole there, Sam, just rocking that landing. Yeah, he's lost both skis actually. One has said, sayonara Abel, I'm off to the finish line for some sake. That first year had him running like Carl Lewis to try and clear the rocks. That's like, that's the problem when you have this kind of variable snow, is it's super hard for the riders to understand just how far they're going to go. Abel Moe going super creative, and basically, if you look out past the screen, trying to double half of the entire venue. Yeah, unfortunately, a little, a little bit of a rock snag on the first takeoff, as you could see it just catch his feet up, and then he, he managed to kind of hold it together there, but didn't then have the speed for this long one and clipping rock, the ski gone right away and into a tumble. Oh, that's a real shame, you hate to see it. Look at the passion in his, in his arms there, just, he wanted that so bad. I really love this guy's riding. I think he's one of the real powerhouses. Again, that eye for a line really present there. Just being able to find that, that double angle and link it together, but just not quite having the speed for that final one. I even think just like a couple of meters to the right, he would have been into that snow cone. If you look at these venues, a lot of them have like a bit of a slough coming down, which has filled, filled those landings in better. So if you can get out to those kind of landings, you're going to have a better time. But just a bit close to the rocks, and he tags the rock, and that's it. Yeah, and I think for him, getting that direction that we saw Finn take was, was challenging after essentially fighting for control out of the landing of the last one. So Abel Moga's got a bit of an expedition ahead of him to get a ski. We'll see if we're going to send a ski runner or if uh, if he's going to go the full mountaineering route and toss a boot pack right up the middle of the ozone face. Well, he's storming up there, but uh, I feel like it would be kind of a nice for him. He, d he doesn't need to do any more running. He's already run half a kilometer off that cliff before. I think his pole there is just above him, so he'll get the pole, we'll get a ski runner to collect his ski. So really seeing the different sides of the face, the wind transport on the snow, playing a, a pretty big factor in, in the outcome. 
uh, of this competition here today. Unfortunately, Abel Moga getting hung up on that first takeoff, and then the rest of it was pretty much just into survival mode. Yeah, exactly. And, and what I found really interesting about that is, like, these are two riders, uh, Finn and Abel, that have got almost, like, polar opposite styles, both finding that similar section to, uh, to air through, albeit in slightly different manner. Uh, and, and that's what I love about these competitions at the moment, is this real kind of shifting of the guard, this kind of real, I think, explosion of creativity. We're not just seeing guys going, this is the winning run. I don't know why they're in some kind of pan-Euro-German accent, but like there is a widespread of creativity on offer here, and that to me is a huge part of the sport. Yeah, I agree, and it's it's I think maybe one of the best parts of free ride right now is the diversity in in rider backgrounds and rider styles. They're all packed with skill, but Abel Moga, he's you know he studied under the under the wing of Imar Navarro. He's got that charging style, but with the bag of tricks. Finn Bill is coming straight out of the slope style freestyle world, but still showing you know. And and I think this run and and what we saw happen to Abel is a real testament to the quality of Finn's run that he was able to navigate through all of that and actually manage to find a clean way through. Yeah, Finn Billis is basically like Gordon Lightfooting through there, throwing the fins out the back with that wee 20 channel of his and uh, just dancing his way to glory with an 83 points. We can see a ski dude now sort of, he's got a bit of an expedition ahead of him as well to get there. All right, well, as we w wait for Abel's ski to get collected and our next riders to drop here at Kicking Horse, Golden BC. All right, well, Abel Moga has reached his lost ski there from his tumble, so glad to see that he's all right from that. Unfortunate result for Abel Moga as he is one of, uh, one of the typical delivery men of the highlight reel moments here in the Freeride World Tour, and that one just coming up a touch short, and immediately that ski was out of there. Yeah, cool, Jeff Bezos. That delivery's gone awry for Abel Moga, unfortunately. Man can ski on one ski pretty well, though. Do you know what I think we need to have on a down day is a one-legged figure eight. Oh. Uh, <laughs> did his own ski just take him out? It, it did, yeah. I, I feel like you might want to talk to your team manager. That ski's got some issues. There's some real pent-up hate in that ski. Angry. <laughs> angry about the way that Abel treated it. Unfortunately, <laughs> uh, yeah, sometimes when you get a when you get ahead of steam up, it's hard to slow down when you're on one foot. Uh, so Abel Moga is going to collect his skis there and get himself down. Uh, unfortunate day for the young Spaniard as he, again, you know, just typically known for, for these moments that we, we cherish on the Freeride World Tour and that not the day that he was looking for. So, so far, as promised, glory and heartbreak here in the ski men's category. We've seen some absolutely spectacular runs and we've seen some tough, tough ones go down. Yeah, speaking of having a full head of steam up, looking down the list ahead of us, I'm sure it's going to get cranking again. We've got Carl Renya Eriksson, Manu Bernard, Craig Murray, Leif Mama, Simon Peradon, Maxime Chablot coming up soon. It's an absolute 
swingers best of heavy hitters. Well, here we go, back up to the top. Peak performance rider, Scott Ryder, Carl Regner Erickson, the Swede. He's missing his travel buddy, Christopher Turdell, who, as we said, unfortunately coming down with an illness and not able to uh, to make the journey to Canada. So Carl Regner Erickson holding it down. He's got Reina still to, to mentor him on Team Sweden, but him and Christopher definitely a, a bit of a duo here on the Freeride World Tour. So Carl always showing up with the big tricks and the high speed free ride style. Yeah, as expected, 360 right out of the gate from Carl. This man needs no mentoring. I think he's got one of the sort of most diverse and creative runs on the field. Also a very smooth rider, and we're looking at him come into this double section here, taking a slightly higher approach. He's gonna go more full line. Absolutely massive. Oh, perfect. Clearing the rocks, as you said, more fall line. So a real nice connection with the transition there. Super fast run for Carl Regner there. Uh, you know, we talked about it earlier. <laughs> oh! The, the flat spin over into the finish. I am a huge proponent of mini flips. I think there should be a, a, like a mini flip Olympics where you can only get two feet of air. And I want to see like, you know, we've had big air. Big air's been around for a long time. Carl Renier there to me, keeping things a little simpler. Not so many tricks as we might expect from him, but really smart skiing. He knows he's going through to the final stops. Yeah, that 360, really backing yourself with that and then straight in, kind of turning the cornice air into a double. And then I really like his take on this. You can see the tracks from the other two guys going the other direction and ending up going quite a lot bigger, clearing that last rock line and then just opening it up down through the powder. And yeah, it's not Monday, but a mini flip from Carl Regner Erickson into the finish. Uh, if you are a Region 2 free ride fan you'll be used to riders having to come to a complete stop before the judging uh finishes these riders once they're through the arch they're good so that's not going to count for for carl's run that was just for fun thanks for clarifying that uh really interesting run there probably a bit more hard charging good to see him like he's known for his tricks but he's got a beautiful turn on him coming from the frozen north of sweden been a big fan of this guy skiing for a while. Be really interested to see where that oh, run nice. places him. Basically faultless. Was <laughs> good, All right, score coming in for Carl Regner Erickson, a 79. So moving into fourth, a solid, solid score there for Carl as he was really looking for anywhere in the top 10. He's going to be guaranteed to be into the finals, and we really want to see Carl. On, uh, on the next stops as he's always fireworks when we get to, when you get a Swede to Fever Brew and you're guaranteed somebody's gonna hit the Eagle and that just stokes me right out. Big question I had with Marcus, uh, sorry, with Carl there was what's under that beanie? Has he got a can of beans for later on? Because he's full of beans. He is full of beans. So here we are looking at our standing so far. The young whistle rider, Marcus Gogan, sitting on top. Valley Rayner in second. But we are not pausing. Manu Barnard, another young Kiwi, making a big splash on the Freeride World Tour, having a great season last year on the Challengers, and having, uh, you know, coming off a real tough one in Andorra. But Manu Barnard, one of the most stylish riders, doing it uh, for Team Dynastar, and he's got a deep bag of tricks. I love watching Manu ski. It's a really playful style of skiing. I've, I've watched this guy growing up. He is one of the nicest kids I've ever met, coming from great stock out of Wanaka with uh, beautiful parents, uh, Hugh and Letitia. I love watching this guy ski and I'm really excited to see his take on this face. He just works his way down. They're just kind of bouncing around. I'm sure he probably got something bopping in the headphones. He's got his groove on. Yeah, super smooth, always stylish as Manu now heading towards the cornice. You s you'll sometimes <laughs> see some of the riders kind of move towards the cornice. It gives them a look at where they are on the face and then they make a little turn. So Manu with the entry now coming high on this thing, turning, getting himself set up. Ooh, little hop turn, taking a double. He's going elsewhere. Manu keeping us guessing, getting a little bogged. I think I remember seeing there's a bit of a flat spot in there that's just caught him out a little bit. This is probably not quite going to his plan, unfortunately. 
but I'm curious to see where he's taken this. He's working down towards this nose we've seen sent to the moon before. And a 360 through the channel, so Manu taking his time to get into it through that ultra technical section, but then delivering right away as he's trying to get high enough to catch the last piece of this feature. He does airplane turn landing right in the hole under that rock. That rock well, definitely a low flat spot, but Manu with those long legs able to handle it using every centimeter of travel he's got in those shocks. Yeah, I don't know what Hugh's been feeding him, but he's definitely shot up in height of late. Uh, bit of a tricky one there for Manu, unfortunately, I think, getting a little caught up uh, with his line, but just delivering with that 360. I love seeing that creativity. I love seeing something different. He's bopping around, yeah, giving a little play on the outrun there. <laughs> Mate, I'm proud of you, and I hope you are. That three was Woo. wild. Cheers. Yeah, as we can see here, he's just working down that rock spine. Really difficult, kind of almost like a hand drag entrance there. Just pushing off the rocks, fighting for that entrance. Look at that set, kind of a hand drag almost. Yeah, over that gully. That was a cool move there for Manu. And then catching the last little bit of this one straight into the rock well, but handling it like a boss. So a little dock and fluidity mm -hmm. as it was tricky. And it, you know, it looked in, in the early stages like the snow was way deeper there than he expected. Yeah, that ski getting taken out behind him. But I would have loved to have seen him actually hold that pose and just cross the finish line on one ski in a glorious kind of flying eel maneuver. I think that really could have brought a few more extra points out of the judges, but I'm just speculating. I love to speculate. Let's see what they have to say about this. He's a happy little creature most days anyway. All right, score coming in for Manu Barnard. So a 68-00, moving him into fifth. So we're going to see what that what that does uh, yep. overall. Manu looking for a strong result here, doing his bit. Little hung up at the top, but the rest of his run really spectacular. So Manu Barnard wrapping up his day here at Kicking Horse. And we head straight back up to the top. This field absolutely stacked, and we've got back-to-back -back Kiwis dropping out of the start gate. And this man, we can expect something spectacular. Craig Murray getting ready to kick things off. It's been a tough start for Craig Murray, but you can never count him out. And he has had some of the most spectacular moments of any riders ever mm. on this exact face. So Craig Murray getting ready to launch the rocket out of the start gate here at Golden BC. Yeah, I think Craig has uh, really set the bar on this face for what is possible here, and I am super fired up, answering the pants. I don't even need the towel on my steel seat right now to keep these loins warm. This guy has got me fired up. Well, Craig Murray going back to his happy hunting ground down the ridge. We've seen him deliver down there before, and guaranteed we're going to see something special out of Craig Murray. Yeah. Craig likes to warm up with three toe touches and one cat cow, though he's a bit tentative with cold kneecaps, as am I in the booth here. But I'm sure he's going to warm us all up very shortly. 92 points to take the top spot. I think that's definitely still on the cards with what we know this guy can do. Yeah, absolutely. So Craig Murray coming into this entrance that's starting to been had seen a little bit more traffic and a little snagged up there. Are we going to see him go kind of a similar direction that we saw Manu go, or completely the other side? So going the full extreme skiing route, Craig Murray punching through the spines. That one a little bit too uphill for him to continue with momentum, but right away back into it. A big air there. And blowing a shoe off his foot there. I was talking to Craig earlier in the day, and he said he was going to sort of assess the zone uh, during the comp. We can see massive amounts of rock in his landing there. I hope he's all right. Those atomics of his would have taken an absolute whipping there. Struggling to get back to his feet. That's a real shame. I think we we're expecting fireworks, but you can see with the conditions like this, that can just get you unstuck a little bit. Yeah, it's it's kind of the nature of the, the ozone face right now, subscribing to where there's smoke, there's fire. Anywhere where you see a lot of a lot of exposed rock, odds are pretty high that there's a whole lot of not exposed rock that's just lurking under the surface. And you can see Craig's entire bomb hole, more than a ski length, is just rock. Probably about maybe just last night's snow sitting on top of that. Yeah, I bet he was kind of betting that snow had been coming off that and filling that in, but it's just not filled it in as high as he would have liked. Great angle on that air there. You can just see just coming unstuck. Ah, that's a bit of a heartbreak there, and so close to Valentine's Day as well. What a shame. Just kicking his way up the slope, trying to retrieve his kit. I think, I mean, this man comes from absolute pedigree stock of athleticism, so he'll be able to get that himself. No worries, I'm sure. 
his parents actually are still, I believe, hold the records for the multi-sport event yeah. in New Zealand uh, of the coast to coast, which crosses the South Island. Beautiful people as well. Keen outdoorsmen. The Murrays are absolute weapons. His brother Charlie, an enduro bike racer now, just known for maximum speed and style, which we see in Craig skiing as well. Yeah, and Charlie Murray, no slouch on the skis uh, as well as super strong skier. We saw him in the juniors and the qualifiers and then going the full pro biker route. And definitely uh, that is paying off for young Charlie. But unfortunately for Craig, as he mountaineers his way back up to a ski, that's going to be the end of the day. If you lose your skis, it is a no score. And Craig was another rider who was looking for a big result today to cross, the, cross to the good side of the cut and make his way into FWT finals. Yeah, that is the thing with crunch time that you really can't hold back here. It was all or nothing for Craig today, and unfortunately he's been left holding an empty paper bag. But I'm sure he's smiling. This guy has such a bright future. I'm sure everybody has seen probably one of the most monumental airs of all time, which is a huge thing to say <laughs> with that double flat in Alaska uh, with MSP Productions. Craig also creating his own series down in New Zealand with a beautiful film about the club field scene in New Zealand with Highway 73. Go check that out online. It just showcases what I love about New Zealand skiing so much. And I just love seeing what this guy does in the mountains. Yeah, so we're seeing the uh, some of the ski women making their way up to the top. It's a relatively, at least on the scale of the Freeride World Tour, a relatively short hike from the top of the Stairway to Heaven chair up to the top of Ozone. So some of the women arriving nice and early to get themselves into the zone. Olivia McNeil there getting set for her big debut once the ski women kick off, but we are uh, still right in the heart of the ski men's category here in the Ozone Face at Kicking Horse Mountain Resort in Golden, BC, delivering a big day for us. We're definitely seeing snow conditions on different parts of the face come into play with, uh, with the riders out there. It seems like the, the, the gullies and the low points are filled in nicely. There's a few spots where the snow has been deposited by the wind, but also finding plenty of spots where the snow has been stripped off by the wind, and it's always a roll of the dice for the riders when they're choosing their line. Yeah, exactly. And coming up next, we have a rider with a completely sort of different style, you would say. A bit of a, a, bit of a throwback, really hard charging with that beautiful line, absolutely drilled to the floor with speed in Leaf Mumma. What can you tell me about him? I, I love, love, love watching Leaf Mumma ski. I've been, I've been kind of exposed to him since he was a junior. He was one of the standout junior riders on the IFSA uh, tour here in Region 2. And, you know, I, I remember the first, one of the first times I met him was at World Junior Championships in Kappel, Austria. And he skipped the entire upper set section of the venue and hit the biggest cliff on the whole face out the bottom, landed it clean, and then got eaten up by Avi Debris at the bottom. And I was like, who is this kid from Alaska? That was wild. And his debut on the Freeride World Tour was one of my favorite runs of all time. Uh, he won the peak performance radical moment for it. Perfect skiing, almost looking like a World Cup ski racer down a narrow icy couloir and then a massive double out the bottom. And one thing we haven't seen much of from Leith that he's got under the belt is a big bag of tricks. He's, he's, he's the full package here. But for me, the standout aspect of Leith Moma skiing is his, his his ski technique, the turns he makes, make me so happy. So here we see the AK master. He's a fisherman, commercial fisherman in the summer and spends his winters rallying around a combo of uh, Alaska and Alaska Resort and down in Bozeman, Montana. Leaf just getting those final preparations done before he drops in here. Yeah. I'm a big fan of leaf skiing myself. Like it's great to me to see this real mixture, you know, like really showing good ski technique. I, I still think there's a huge place for that in freeride com uh, competitive skiing, being able to show that mastery of the turn, the full speed, the absolute control and technique, not just a bag of tricks. This is the full show here, and I think this guy is, as you say, the full packed package. I'll be looking to see what he's going to unleash today. He needs a big result himself. You know, a top four place would guarantee him in the in the next two stops, I believe. So a huge cheer for Craig Murray. He yeah. is a rider favorite and for sure a fan favorite. A Kicking a horse, here, having huh? a bit of a a bit of a tough day, or providing a bit of a tough day there for Craig. But as you see, the spirit lives on in Craig Murray. Always happy, always uh, you know, just just kind of bubbling with joy. And and one of the probably guys who just loves skiing the most out of this whole field. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, that's the thing with kicking horse. You've got to grab it by the haunches, and that does mean sometimes you're going to get kicked. Yeah, you get you get bucked. 
by Kicking Horse. And here we see the rest of the ski men's field and some of the ski women making their way up. A chilly day here at Kicking Horse. Perfect sunshine. Uh, it was a bit of a, a bit of a question mark as the forecast coming into today was really up and down and, and, and quite variable changing. But the, the organizing crew for Freeride World Tour just absolutely nailing the day. You know, there was some thought of running yesterday and then it ended up being a little bit murky. Today we've got perfect sunshine. We had a nice little top up of snow. Sam Smoothie and I in the booth just loving the show. Shout out to Anna Smoothie. Uh, we're missing you here. Broken ankle, unfortunately not able to travel over from Europe. So yeah. we got Sam in the booth holding it down for the Smoothie family at the Freeride World Tour. Yeah, exactly. They asked my dad to commentate, but he pretty much doesn't really get much past me until about six wines deep. So... Grateful to step in, you know, cleaning up Anna's mess and just trying to do my best here. But we miss you, Anna, and, you know, that was my chance to see her this year. Well, it's great to have you back here with the Tour family. I know the riders were stoked when uh, when Sam Smoothie walked into the, the riders group. Enjoying uh, enjoying the fruits of Revelstoke for the winter? Yeah, I'm a big fan of fruit, to be honest. I mean, I come from Cromwell, and we have a pile of big fruit there. But someone that's got big fruit is Leaf Mama. <laughs> so Leaf is going to be... The next guy out of the gate as we're just kind of holding on here. You can see Max Hitzig, Ross, Ross Tester, and A. Paul, Andrew Pollard up there just kind of trading stories. I don't know if they're giving away secrets mm. or holding it tight to the chest there. Yeah, that's the thing, isn't it? These these little breaks can be quite tough for the riders as well. You know, you've kind of been prepped. You're like, all right, one minute to go. I've got myself ready, got my kit together, I've got my mental set, and then you've got to wait for two minutes. And that can be a really tough thing to deal with, you know. It can play on you like, you know, it's like staring into the abyss for too long. you got to get going sometimes. I hope that doesn't uh, play on Leaf's mind too much, but he's an experienced operator. He is, yeah. He was a solid junior rider up through the qualifiers and, uh, and now on the Freeride World Tour. It's it's really cool to see kind of the evolution of free ride as, as now a lot of riders coming out of free ride clubs, out of juniors, and they're coming onto the tour, but with a ton of experience already. They're, they're seasoned competitors. And speaking of that, we've got an opportunity now to catch up with a very young but very seasoned rider. We're going to go check in at the hot seat with Whistler Freeride Club's own Marcus Gogan. Marcus, what a great way to kick off the day. Only the fifth guy down and that run. I mean, it was a little touch and go there. How to describe that turn off the second air into the backflip. Yeah, I definitely didn't think I was going to make that air whatsoever, but uh, managed to get on that downhill ski and pull it together. It didn't really go as big as I wanted to go, but I landed, so I guess that's all that really matters, and hopefully we can make the cut with that. So we saw you weren't quite able to get into Ralph's track. There was one track on the takeoff, but you were just a little above, above it. Describe setting that flip with your ski, your legs pretty much boot deep in the powder. Deep in the powder. Yeah, I, I really had to push my feet through the lip. I was also, like, after that turn, uh, my momentum kind of slowed a little bit, so I really had to pop and push my feet forward and kind of just, like, pretty quick flip. I think I... Looks like, yeah, I almost hit my head off the takeoff, but it worked out okay. So, yeah, I'm stoked, super stoked. Uh, worked out okay. The understatement of the day so far here in the ski men's category. Marcus Gogan holding it down in the hot seat just about halfway through the ski men's field. So congrats so far. Still a lot of talent up there to come. <laughs> I want to see yeah. what happens when he's like actually impressed with himself. Like that just makes me shudder in my seat. What's, what has he got planned for us? What kind of devilish tricks has he got up his sleeve? Yeah, for sure. Marcus Gogan, always his own harshest critic, and working out there for him. As he said, it was a it was a hard push to get on that downhill ski. And uh, you know, coaches out there, that's why we do the drills on the down days when we don't have powder. So you get that bag of, bag of skills up to par with the bag of tricks. We are ready to go here. Leaf Mama, 22 years old, rookie on the Freeride World Tour. We've, we've, uh, we've been gushing about his skiing, and now he's ready to show us and back up what we've been saying. Yeah, exactly. I'm expecting full sploosh on this gush here, so he's dropping into the face. Really interested to see what his line choice is, as he's dropping a bit more central through the venue than we've seen from a lot of the riders of late. Yeah, Leaf Mama loves the hard charging style. He likes to go big, and I think we're going to see him into uh, maybe the not-so-playful zone as he gets things going here with a big, big 
handful of speed going super technical there. This is definitely a thin section of the face as Leaf Mama making his way through. So techy. Jeez, Willikas, he is just dancing his way through that thing. What control and just just agility, really. Slide to his left. And oh, into the no. Logan Bohoda section. Unfortunately, getting bucked onto his side off the takeoff as the mountain just erupts to his left. Leaf not able to hold on to that. As you said, such quick feet as he landed. It looks like on a pretty big pile of rocks, but he's got both skis and he is skiing out. So hopefully Leaf is okay from that. That was quite a uh, dramatic moment there for the young Alaskan rider. Just not quite able to hold it. We, you saw the quick feet getting down to that section. Cat-like reflexes for Leaf Mama as the mountain just exploding beside him. Yeah, as someone who's unfortunately landed on too many rocks himself, I can tell you that is not what you want to be doing. Stating the obvious, of course, but I'm hoping is all right. That is a tough cookie. Look at this, just look at these turns, just ripping through this tight technical section. Just left, right, dodging that tree between his legs, getting the takeoff, putting it to his feet, dancing past that tree. Super technical skiing there. And you can see over on his left side, oh, he just got bucked by that, a little bit more uphill oh. than he was expecting. And Leaf getting rolled onto his side, taking it to his, they breed him tough in Alaska. Hopefully Leaf's gonna be all right down there just trading stories with the crew at the finish. Yeah, that guy's obviously been eating his salmon. He's just really had to hold on to that wriggly one. Look at that line, just super direct. That is a man who likes four line charging skiing, finding, I think probably one of the most technical places in this space to dance through, as I'm watching the absolute anxious drips run off Derek's nose. <laughs> yeah, that was that was intense for Leaf. Happy to see him in uh, in the finish area. The characteristic smile on his face. Yeah, I it. I just want to know. I want to see a cross angle of that bottom here. He was close to some of those rocks as he flew across that massive ear. Now, set me right. Is that one of those ears? Is that the ear we saw? Logan Pahoda hit. Yeah, I think so. For for Leaf, I think he was kind of aiming for that exact same nose. And we can see the damage, that little slide, that little pocket release, about 50 meters wide above a really technical section. That's going to come into play for other riders, as that is a zone we would have expected some people to get into, to that bottom ear, just ski is right of where Leaf was skiing. Yeah, exactly. So hopefully the riders at the top are going to get that info so they know what's happened in there, because that took pretty much all the snow off that section of the face. Uh, kind of a big hanging pocket now. The crown line looks pretty deep, so a big chunk of snow yeah, like that's the thing. The guys here at King, uh, Kicking Horse have done a really great job of controlling this face in really tough conditions this year. We've got numerous uh, suspect layers, and they've worked really hard to make this face as safe as possible. Uh, full credit to those guys. But as you can see, it's just an unsupported slab above a large ear. It's super difficult to get all that set on properly with the snowpack that we're dealing with right now. So score dropping for Leaf at 39, 6, 7. So again, another rider, not quite the day they were looking for. So Leaf Mama now has wrapped things up. Glad to see him safe and sound at the bottom. That was an intense moment for the young Alaskan. We're seeing the start gate here. Kind of a, a nice one for the riders. A lot of these start gates on the Freeride World Tour are knife ridge, barely a, a spot to get a toe pick in. This one, a nice flat plateau at the top of the ozone face. As we zoom in onto our next skier out of the gate, the young Verbier rider doing it for Scott as well. Simone Paradon coming on with a really strong campaign so far on the Freeride World Tour. He was saying at the very beginning of the season that because he's young and he's got his whole crew of young shredders in Verbier that he feels like he needs to send it for the boys back home. And he's definitely been doing that, but smart riding as well for Simone Paradon. He's only 20 years old. Another real tall rider, a long leg is a strong leg, and Simon definitely demonstrating that so far here on the tour as he thumps his chest Tarzan style and pushes out of the gate. You gotta love a good bit of chest thumping in this. Sometimes it's nice, you know, just get the, get the testosterone flowing a little bit, get that little extra bit of boost. And I think this is the day when you really need it, when it's coming down to crunch time. Yeah, so Simon sitting seventh overall right now, kind of happily above the cut. And a few of the guys that were looking to, you know, shuffle things have had had tough, tough runs here at Kicking Horse. So, but I, I have a feeling we're not going to see Simon hold back at all with a 360 off the cornice. 
wow, he took that deep as well. And he's just working his way back down to this next feature, keeping the flow going really nicely. Look at that quiet, easy style he has on the turns. Really nice, powerful skiing. You can see he's eyeing up this section here. We've seen a lot of people come through. Little bit of snow. No way. Are you kidding oh, me? Spinning onto the pad of the double, but just a touch too far. And unfortunately, connecting with the rocks. Look at the cat-like moves from Simon Peridon, just skiing it out on one ski. Unfortunately, the, the pad of that double not delivering a, a padded experience and taking his ski for a ride with him. That was a bold move there from Simon Peridon. Yeah, it really was. I think almost it looks like he went a bit long on that 360. I think he probably would have wanted to touch. You can see his tracks there. I think he would have wanted to touch down a couple of meters high to give himself that room and potentially have a better landing. Look at all those sharks there. Nom, 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 nom. They've just eaten up that ski. Yeah, that's a mess. And Simon would have wanted to be airing over that whole section. And if he did get down lower, definitely cleaner. A great entry in all the way down. And that corners debris wasn't there earlier. Some of the other riders kicking that off. And here we go. You can just see him setting the 360 there. He gets it around nicely, but just lands dead on rocks. I hope his head's all right there. He sort of dove it in through another section just beside those Christmas trees there. Man, this, uh, this mountain is really proving to be a tasty little morsel that wants to eat them up. Yeah, taking no prisoners here, the ozone face. That's going to be a bit of a project for the ski runner to go collect that one right underneath that double. So Simon Peridon, uh, no score again for, uh, for another rider. So yeah, ozone, ozone definitely delivering. A couple riders getting bucked here. Hopefully Simon Peridon is all right. That was a tough spot to land. Yeah, it's a real shame. He's been a really consistent rider with 6th and 7th places so far. I think like a run like that could have really put him up in a similar position. So we can see the ski dude working his way across to where the ski's clinging onto the rocks. It doesn't want to go home. You know, caught up in a little, uh, little, old, little old tree there, the alpine trees. Uh, you know, they don't have a lot of growing season, so they grow them tough, stubbly, and, and grabbing Simon's ski as he went by. So we have Maxime Chablot in the start gate. One of the few people guaranteed a spot in the finals. He's our current world number one, wearing the platinum bib, because obviously the bibs at go, uh, Golden Kicking Horse are golden. We'll see what he's going to have to say with himself here. No wins this season. Came onto the tour last year with an absolute blitz of fury. Talk us through that. Yeah, I mean, he had a he had a bit of a, a rough start in the first event and then came back swinging with a win in Andorra and then backing that up. So he's got a win here in Kicking Horse from last season and he's going to be looking to, uh, to put a W on the board. He is sitting first overall right now, but as you said, Sam, no wins. Uh, he's got a fifth and a third. And he, Maxime, or he, Max Palm, and Max Hitzig all super tight uh, yeah. stacked up at the top of the rankings. Only 21 years old. Jeez. And Maxime Chablot already with a tour title and a win in Verbier <laughs> under his belt in one season. So Maxime Chablot is going to be looking to, uh, to back up his win here in Kicking Horse with another spectacular run. That's what I do find crazy these days is these young guys are seeming so experienced, such a talented bag of a variety of techniques and tricks and the full setup of skills that you need to compete at this. I honestly thought he was six years older than that, having seen what he's been capable of. Well, it's it's a testament to the whole junior program. Maxime, one of four freeride junior world champions in the ski men's field. He, Max Palm, Rocks, Ross Tester, and Marcus Gogan, all freeride junior champions. Oh. Hand drag 360 to start things off straight into another cliff. Beautifully creative start there from Maxim. He's absolutely humming. Cork seven, is he going to get it? Oh, no. Shorts it. Unfortunate. So we've seen that takeoff be tricky for the riders as the snow deep. It's really stacked up on the takeoff. And you can see Maxime's feet just getting a little hung up as he set the mm. seven. And then the rotation just not quite there. What I like about this is Max knows he's through to the next two stops. So what I can see he's doing for there is going for the top spot. He doesn't need a low result. He's looking for that overall title to back it up from last year, which is an incredibly hard thing to do. So he's gone all out here today. That cork seven just not quite sitting the rotation to bring it back to his feet. Massive shame there, but really great intent from the young guy. Well, this hand drag 360 over <laughs> the exposure off the cornice, really backing himself as if that one doesn't work. He is in doom. And then you can see him get hung up on the takeoff of that and the rotation just not quite there for Maxime. 
Yeah, you can see the frustration on the young rider there. Super talented guy though, so we're going to see plenty more from him in this year's tour and indeed the future. Also, love to see some pastels coming in. It's a really nice variety from, you know, the uniform black. I'm a big fan of black myself, but I'm loving that jacket. I wanted to. I did push. All right, well, Maxime, yeah, definitely a little bit bummed on that one as he was looking to put down another one of those highlight reel Junior runs. Junior Holes, shout out. <laughs> but he's definitely in good spirits. He found one of the uh, rare spots on the on the face that you can land on your side and be completely fine. That rider, or looker's left side, definitely it's a little deeper. So a 49 there for Maxime Chablot. As we are taking the best two out of three, that's going to be a throwaway for Maxime. I really liked with that... Uh, Handrake 360 to Cliff that he caught this beautiful piece of uh, transition that really helped him build the speed into that cork seven, but just not getting that set off the takeoff that he'd been looking for as we cut back to the top. Yeah, Marcus Gogan, Valley Rayner, Finn Billis, Carl Regner Erickson, and Manu Barnard holding down the top five currently, but we still have a talented group of riders up top, and this one, it is the Battle of the Maxes this year. Max Palm, he is another one, 20 years old. He came on as a wild card last year and, and really proved that wild card with a win, uh, which seems to just be the way now, seeing uh, you know Marcus Gogan kind of on the same program. So Max Palm, he had a great run in Andorra, and then unfortunately just got too stoked at the bottom, throwing some little shifties and going down. So Max Palm going to be looking to uh, to kind of redeem himself on that one as he just plays with the razor's edge on the side of the corners. Yeah, Max blowing a kiss to me in the start gate as I asked for. He's such a cute guy. Where is he going to take this? He's going more central here with a new... Oh! Left 360, loses the ski out of the back but pulls it back together in a very technical piece of agility right there into the slide path of that piece before. The snow in there is going to be absolutely heinous. Let's see how he deals with this takeoff. Scrubbing a bit of skied, working towards that takeoff. Smart skiing there. Commentator's oh, curse somewhat as he fights it. Wow! He has really had to work to hold on to that one. I'm not sure if he knew that that had gone. It, yeah, I mean, it, it, you'd be hard pressed to still go in there. You could kind of see almost by his body language when he dropped off the crown line onto the bed surface that he, he was not expecting it to be looking like that. Mm. And then from the rest of uh, the rest of the way down was just holding on to it. Yeah, full credit to the guy there. What I like about him is he's got a really good ski technique. You can see him fighting through that bed surface. That is not a bed you want to lay down in. The hand drag 360 into that just like absolutely blowing my mind. Look how sharky that takeoff is. Prioli over the rocks into the bed surface, fighting like an absolute bull rider to stay on top of that thing. Look at the hits he's taking with his knees. That guy's got young tendons. Yeah, and and you know Max has spent a ton of time in the in the preseason this year in the gym, kind of bulking up. 20 years old, so he's really just growing into his into his body and kind of filling it out. And I think uh, that was well worth every single squat and sit up he did, because the strength and the ski technique got him through that. So you can see control little bit down but he was able to hold on to it so it stays on uh, on the green side of the scale for Max Palm there. Yes yeah, I'm sure the fans here in British Columbia will know green is good. We're waiting for the score to see what they're going to deliver on that really tricky one for the judges I think. Definitely some control issues there. I don't think it's going to challenge the top spot. Speculating Sam here probably shouldn't be doing that but there's a long wait here. A nervous wait. Probably one of the worst bits I think. You know he's happy to be down. He's landed a reasonably good run. I imagine this is a man with exceedingly high standards, not going quite how he wanted. But I would say it's better than what we've seen from some of these guys on this really tough day of competing. It is, yeah. And Max Palm, one of four men who are guaranteed with the results they've already got to be into the final. So uh, we'll see if this is going to eclipse the the twelfth place that he had in Andorra with that unfortunate <laughs> fall, but either way he's going on into FWT finals. So Max Palm, yeah, you said that his standards for himself uh, are so high that that's probably not going to match what he was hoping for today. But he's down and he's on his feet and in a field on a day of a lot of falls. Unfortunately for for some of the riders, still potentially going to be something to hold on to. So seventh so far for Max Palm with a 62. We do have plenty of riders to come as we look to cut back up to the top. 
Who are you excited about in the next few people coming down? Well, I love watching the next rider in the gate ski. Getting Max just getting a hug there from the peak performance team manager, Nicholas Lundgren. He's uh, always supporting the riders. But this guy riding out of Sugar Bowl in California, one of many Tahoe riders on the tour, one of the best spirits on the Freeride World Tour. Another one who has a medal from Freeride Junior World Championships, took a break from competing for a bunch of years and kind of came back to it last year with a new mindset of like, I'm not in this for, for results. I'm in it because I love the community and I want to hang out with the crew. Xander Gouldman, though, always dangerous when he kicks out of the start gate. Yeah, I think he's definitely one of those guys that's sort of intrinsically motivated by the line, by the mountain and the skiing he wants to portray. And not, not necessarily the results or what the or what indeed the scores are going to come in at. He's there to put on the show that he wants to do and skis for, skis for the love and skis from the heart, I think. Yeah, and he's such a happy guy. If you get a chance to hang out with him and chat with him, he's just he's got such a great spirit, always having a good time, a, a rider favorite. Everyone loves hanging out with Xander as he's kind of looking at where he's at on the cornice, spotting, uh, spotting the in-runs. The visual inspection, when you look at it from the bottom, it's really hard to see anything from above the cornice. Now, Xander may be getting a little bit of a, a bonus by, by seeing some old tracks or other tracks from riders going way down the ridge here to the rider's right. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see what he makes of this entrance here. Right side 360, going a bit further skiers right. Nice and smooth through that air there, working his way, grabbing another one off the side of that one to give him more chance at this one. No way! Screaming Seaman 360! Hold on I to love it, you. Yes! <laughs> so Screaming Seaman 360, you cannot understate how risky that is. Skis crossed in the air. We saw him do a straight Screaming Seaman in Spain and upping the game with a 360. This is the Xander Goldman that we that. came here to see, and that was absolutely spectacular the 360 off the corners uh, above the exposure that gets the judges by the throat right off the bat and then backing it up with that huge air exactly just like getting the judges going getting those points going immediately you want to be raising the meter with the bat, raising that excitement of the judges and you just keep providing excitement and like I don't think anyone here was expecting I don't know Xander well I don't think like the scream and seaman Glenn Plake has got to be loving that if he's watching today Glenn you should be this is brilliant stuff yeah we'll take a look on on the replay but Xander known for spinning both ways hello Getting the pole plant with that as well on the takeoff there. Candide style. I love it. And there you can see, he doesn't take it off the nose, takes it to the left more so he can set up for this. Oh, that! did he grab that screaming seaman as well? And spinning it the other way. So right three off the corners and then the left three with the screaming seaman. Yeah, it looks like he did catch a grab there and just exploding into the powder, losing his foot there, but absolutely cat-like reflexes for Xander Goldman. This guy. Yeah. <laughs> That guy obviously stretches his hips. The spirit of skiing alive and well with Xander as finding a brand new take on this face and absolutely going huge on that one. So the judges having their work cut out for them from Xander Goldman, and he is a happy man in the finish area. Yeah, I'm really, really interested to see what the judges make of that. He's got tricks, he's got a smooth, strong riding style. He's gone that far, uh, look his left side, which we've seen score super well today and in the past. Man, how happy are you to be a commentator and not a judge right now? I thought it was really good. I enjoyed it. Yeah! <laughs> It's always yeah, nice being a little bit of paparazzi so on the fly. side listening in. All right, well, score dropping for Xander Goldman is 76 0. So into fifth for the Sugar Bowl Yay! rider. And Xander Goldman all cheers in the finish area. Big fist bump for Marcus as he makes his way off with 76 points for Xander. Yeah, Xander needing a top four finish to guarantee his place in the finals, but he's made a very strong case for that. And in a day like today, it's going to be really interesting to see how that plays out in the overall standings. I really hope to see him there. I'm loving watching his skiing. Yeah, that was a great one. So here we go back up. This man granted a wild card early on. He's been a fixture on the qualifiers and the Challenger Tour. Oscar Mendez, a solid, solid entry onto the Freeride World Tour, really backing up that wild card with a second place. He's got the some of the best backflips in the game. And Oscar Mendez, I expect uh, we're going to see him out to the right and into that good snow zone.
Mm, also really nice to see the return of the goatee here today. I'm super happy about that. Sometimes it's nice to have a little bit of bristle on your chin. Gives you that little bit of extra padding if you're going to chuck your knees into your face. But I don't think this guy does. He is known for absolute bolts landing, big ears, and super explosive skiing. Yeah, so Oscar making his way all the way down the ridge, just chopping a chunk of that cornice off as he went by. I think it was far enough behind, he may not have even noticed it. And now um, Oscar into the guts of it. Yeah, I'm wondering if Ski Patrol has requested the riders do a little bit of control work for them as he's working his way fluidly through this technical zone, flying off that and just stomping it super clean, working his way back, skiers left. I'm really excited to see where he takes his next piece into this big piece of technical riding. Full line, huge air. And square onto his feet, and Oscar Ooh. getting up nice and high with a ton of speed, and the highest take of a big transfer. Oscar clean, and wow. just right in the side of that crown line. No, hold on to it. No! Tab keyed. Oh, that is a crying shame. I, he stomped that into some of the worst snow in the venue, and he looked clean. And I, I oh my God, I am, I am heartbroken for the guy. That, was an absolute beauty run. That high takeoff, really getting the surprise points for going higher and bigger and faster off that large bottom feature. That is an absolute crying shame. You hate to see that. Oh, into that deposit. He had all the hard work done. Such a strong top section, going so fast through that technical section and taking it way out. The further you get from the bottom of these cliffs, the safer you are. And this one going absolutely massive. And now it's just to ski it out. And <sighs> That's the thing, I mean, to me as a competitor, you don't want to be leaving points on the board and he'd line himself up for that big air. And I think trying to make that turn in the debris might have been his undoing. Sometimes it's better just to point it through the muck and just hold on and brace. And he wanted to control it, but sometimes you kind of, especially kicking horse, you've got to let it buck. And that's cost him there, unfortunately. Devastating there for Oscar Mendez as he had such a solid run all the way through until he got into the debris pile. So no score for Oscar as his skis came off. That is heartbreaking. You can just see the body language. He is absolutely floored by that one. Mate, I feel for you. At this, at this point in the tour, you know, this is the real tough thing for the riders, the that it is make or break moment at crunch time. And that's just come unstuck from a little bit. But this is definitely a rider I expect to see big things from the future. I think he is really one of the future riders for us on the tour. Well, that was so strong. So we go back up, ski men not done. Andrew Pollard, A. Paul, skiing out of Alta, Utah. We had his sister, a fixture on the tour, J. Paul, Jacqueline Pollard, gonna be watching at home, cheering on, big brother. Uh, 14th right now, Andrew another one looking for uh, looking for a result here to put himself up, well that said 14th, but actually 10th um, in the standing. So A-Paul with the trademark antenna there and getting things started. We had a big art exhibit, Andrew designing all the bibs and all the posters for the Freeride World Tour. He is as passionate about art as he is about freeride skiing. <laughs> A great season in Alta, Utah, uh, 500 plus inches of snow. Every time he leaves, he's got a hard time going as they are just having a ma just majestic season of snowfall down there in Utah. Yeah, A-Pole to me is one of those skiers that is super enjoyable to watch. You never quite know where he's going to go line-wise. Exceptionally creative skier and person, as you mentioned, about the art. And just, you know, it's great to sort of learn a bit more of these riders outside of just their ability, you know. Turns out they're all actually like humans. Pretty awesome humans at that. A-Paul kind of taking the mantle from Drew Tabke. Always creative, always kind of moving sideways and gunning wow. it over that section into the gully. So smooth and fast for Andrew Pollard with a 360. Oh, how casual was that? That looked like one of the cleanest takeoffs and spins. Very stylish, very tight in the air. Absolute nailing of the landing. He's just put that. He's just put that one out there, and I'm I'm really stoked. I love watching this guy ski. He always, to me, makes it look easy. Almost kind of like that Rane Barkered thing. Almost sometimes, maybe to the point of like, was that that hard? You know, so like, and but that was like, we've seen people set spins off that, get it round. He made that look so easy, so clean. 
giving a salute to the crowd. That's one for the purists, I think. So smooth, always just technically beautiful. And I think the, the, the moment of that one for me was the landing of the 360 and exploding out of the powder cloud. Didn't even look like he'd left the ground. I love this angle. Look how big he's gone on that. Catching that transition from the spine there and holding a ton of speed, setting that 360. Looks like getting a bit of a safety grab there and putting that down cleaner than we have seen with plenty of holes in that landing as well. Marcus Gogan loving it. A Paul just putting down a classic A Paul line. So smooth. As you said, makes difficult look easy. So we're looking here at our overall standings. Where is Andrew going to slide into that top five? Ooh. Xander, Carl, Finn Billis, Valley Rayner, and Marcus Gogan holding it down at the top right now. So a lot still to come here, but Andrew on, Pollard guys, has done his bit in classic A Paul style. Give it to me. A <laughs> Paul requesting somebody to give it to him. I assume he means the judges. Tough day for them. I, I think that's going to be a really well scored run, though. I, I don't want to sort of put words in their mouth. Yeah, I lost it. All right, score dropping for Apol at 81. So putting himself into fourth, he's happy with that. Andrew Pollard. A Paul really just kind of needing to be in the top five to guarantee his spot. And obviously there are other ways it can shake out, but to guarantee his spot into Freeride World Tour final. So he has done his part here on the Ozone Face Freeride World Tour ski men delivering fireworks. Now we only have two men to go, but they are two men who can have a very, very big say in the rankings today. And with two men to go, that means Marcus Gogan guaranteed to be on the podium here at the Free Ride World Tour, which is just spectacular. Another rookie on the tour. This guy, his ride has been uh, like a rocket elevator, rocket powered elevator. Couple wild cards in the qualifier last year, wild card into Fieber Brun wins that. He's on the tour. Now he's sitting in second overall. Max Hitzig, Austrian rider riding out of Germany. Another one to watch out for and definitely a podium contender. It is really getting down to the business end of things here with all to play for. I'm just, I, I'm like really buzzing to see where he takes this. A rocket powered elevator though sounds like a terrible idea for anyone that's been in an elevator. He's working his way down the far right. Yeah, just kind of scoping out those corner spots as he sets his way in with a 360, clearing the corner's debris. So Max Hitzig now heading out here to Ooh. the rider's right, very steep and into a really technical zone, turning it into a double. He loves his doubles, doesn't he? Why single when you can double? Just really, and I, it's one of those things where you can really prove more points. The judge is going massive off the bottom. No oh, freaking way. Max Hitzig with the biggest air of the day and a backflip so casual. A gigantic statement for the young Austrian rider. Teeing that up right off the nose of the George Rodney, the Yusasaki pyramid. And Max Hitzig taking it with a backflip and the cleanest stomp you could possibly hope for. Somebody picked my jaw up off the ground because that was absolutely ridiculous. That set on that flip, it looked like he just sort of set himself to God in the air and just laid back, looked and waited. Just the patience, the absolute composure in the air to hold that at that speed of what's potentially not a great takeoff this season, going massive into an already somewhat bombed landing. The riders are just absolutely blowing my mind out right now. Every single rider, this looks like a junior comp just running into the finish area to dog pile Max Hitzig. <laughs> The, the judging criteria lit up absolutely like the Vegas Strip, taking this as a double and then just gassing into this pyramid right off the oh, top. Lee, Moses, Seth Morrison, get a call out. <laughs> That is just movie-style skiing there, and Tuff can just look at that Into layout. Into skydiver mode, and the landing just absolutely perfect, fighting for <laughs> it, doing that stand-up <laughs> sit-up. Max Hitzig delivering on the promise as we wait for the score to come there in. It is! It's a 97-6-7 for Max Hitzig. Unbelievable run. So Marcus Gogan <laughs> sliding out of the hot seat, and I think he's going to be all right with that as Max Hitzig just delivered one of the most spectacular <laughs> moments on the Free Ride World Tour. We've only seen one person stomp that air ever. So to take it with a backflip like that and land it like that, wow. Oh my God, I, I'm 
more than mildly stunned for words on that. Just. Well. We're not done, and this one is another one that we can expect a big, big day out of Ross Tester, another Tahoe rider. He's been living in Utah, but definitely a Californian at heart, freeride junior world champion in 2017. Very, very close with Christopher Turdell two years ago for the overall title here on the Freeride World Tour, and a second place at the last event. Ross Tester gonna be looking to fire us up. I'm still struggling to talk. <laughs> oh my lord. He's working his way down the skiers right at the venue. I mean this zone really is seeming to provide the goods in terms of big scores. It'd be super interesting to see what he makes of this. What I love about Ross is he's kind of always got the foot down. He's not casual, he's fast, he's fluid, he's exceptionally controlled, and we know he can go massive. Yeah, and another one with great ski technique as he enters in and just pins it into that same couloir we saw deliver for Apol, and now he's coming in with a big head of steam. 360 off there, putting it down clean. He's working his way across to the left. He's not gonna be able to make that last piece of feature though. So just getting some nice shrelpy turns there. Earlier yesterday, Ross told me he was keen to put it to his feet this game. I didn't think he was going to go full guns blazing. He's here for the overall total. He wants it all. He's a hungry, hungry hippo. And he's put down an absolute banger, I think. He has, and all Ross needs to get into finals is a top 13 today. And I think he's safely in yeah. that mix with the, with the amount of crashing that we've seen out of the ski yeah. men. So Ross tests are doing kind of exactly what he needed to do. Yeah, Still Max. a banger run there. But yeah. he's just checking in with Max Hitzig there. Are you OK in the head, bud? Squirrely, but. We can hear him say a little squirrely. I love that that's your version of a little squirrely. But damn, you can climb a tree fast. Getting this 360. Almost looked like he was setting for the screaming seaman in the three, as we saw from Xander Goldman. These two guys growing up in very similar parts of the world. Maybe screaming seaman threes are just normal in California. I don't know. I can't think of anything worse to do in a free rock competition. But given those big skis, it has a bang. He's stoked, he's put it down. I love watching this guy ski, and I think that's gonna be a great score, and just well done, Ross, there. Yeah, big smile for Ross Tester, doing exactly what he needed to do. As you said, he's in the hunt for, for the overall. He has a 20th under his belt from the first event in Bakira, where he got absolutely ruthlessly attacked by Sharks, and a second, so I think safely gonna be dumping that 20th place result with that run as we wait for the judges to slot that in and see where it's gonna come in uh, to the overall. I bet those judges will be quite happy to see the back of the ski men's field, to be honest. There's been a lot of great runs here. A few issues, you know, some big crashes. It's been the explosive show that we expect from this division as we look at the overall status right now of the rankings. So Valley Rainer really backing up his win. Finn Billis sitting in fourth. Marcus Gogan, the young buck in second. And Max Hicksig with so far the move of the year, the move of the millennia maybe, that backflip off the George Rodney Pyramid. Unbelievable. The top three, wow. that's going to be a tough nut to crack there for Ross Tester. And then Finn Billis and Apol holding down the top five. So just an incredible show from Ski Man. Here we go with the score. It's a 77. He grabs a seventh, easily ditching that score and ensuring his place through to the next two stops of the Freeride World Tour. Max <laughs> exit though. <laughs> Mob. Abs Absolutely mobbed by the rest of the crew. So let's see how it shook out here for ski men. Kicking horse, Golden BC, Max Hitzig grabbing the top spot. Young Marcus Gogan on the podium with a silver medal. Valley Rayner backing things up. Finn Billis closing in on that top three. Apol, Carl Regner, Erickson, Ross Tester. Xander sliding into the top eight. Manu Barnard there. And Rene Barker at rounding out the top ten. And then here we see pretty much that's the line where everybody else had significant issues as we move down. The, uh, the bottom here of the finish sheet, Jamesa Hampton, unfortunately one of many riders getting eaten up with a no score as we head down. This is your podium here at Golden BC Kicking Horse. Max Hitzig, Marcus Gogan, and Valley Rayner, the two Austrians overjoyed to be on the podium together. It is an absolute overrunning from the Young Turks here. 
All right, well, let's see how things have shaken out. A big shake up here as Valley Rayner taking over wow. the top spot. Max Hitzig and Maxime Chablot. Ross Tester taking a big jump up. And Marcus Gogan moving himself comfortably above the cut line. Oscar Menda, even with that tough crash, still sitting pretty on the good side of the cut there. Uh, that is just absolutely unbelievable. Simon Peridon is going to be the last guy qualifying into Verbier. Xander Goldman, unfortunately, on the bad side of the bubble, as well as some huge names in the freeride world. Reina Barker and Abel Moga, Craig Murray, all on the downhill side of the cut. So this is the tough part of the freeride world tour when it comes down to crunch time. Glory and heartbreak uh, once again. All right, well, we are going to head down and catch up with our winner, Max Hitzig. You have got a screw loose, punting a backflip. When you were scoping that, were you thinking that that was going to work? Um, no, I was not sure if it's going to work, but I saw it three years ago when Yusasaki did it, and I wanted to go for the pyramid, and that was the reason why I did it today. Well, you did it and you stomped it and you secured yourself a win on the Free Ride World Tour here at Kicking Horse Golden BC, the first time you've been here and walking away with a W. Congratulations, Max. Thanks, Eric. I'm so stoked. Yeah. Well, just getting another look at that moment, I think we are going to see that go absolutely viral. Max Hitzig locking down the win here at Kicking Horse. Well, we are back and we are nowhere near done. We have completed both the men's field in snowboard and ski, and we are gonna be rolling straight into ski women. Let's see where we're sitting in the overall rankings. The cut looming above the kicking horse stop of the Freeride World Tour. Molly Armanino, the rookie out of uh, California, South Lake Tahoe, holding it down at the top. Justine Dufort Lapointe, our Canadian Olympic hero. And then down, we've got uh, Sibylle and Elizabeth tied in fourth, which puts Olivia McNeil, a standout rider on the, on the Freeride World Tour, on the bad side of the cut. She's gonna need a solid result here to get herself uphill and on to the good side. We're having a look here at Elizabeth Gerritsen preparing to kick things off and our start list right now, just a who's who of free ride women. Molly Armanino, she's sitting in first in that leader's bib. She's gonna be kicking things off for the women. Justine Dufour Lapoint gonna be dropping second. Delilah Quinn, right, another rider out of Tahoe. And then we move down through the who's who and the two Verbier riders, Elizabeth and Sibyl, gonna be closing out the ski women's category. As we are up at the top, a brand new category. No less fireworks expected from these women. The best free ride women on the planet getting set to set things off. Off. And we'll have a look at what you thought at home was going to go down. So Justine Dufour Lapointe really earning uh, the the fan vote here. 64% of you think she's going to be on the podium. Elizabeth Gerritsen, the Freeride World Tour champion, 
uh, 58%, and then current reigning women's ski champion Jess Hodder with 49%. This has been a great delivery for Jess Hodder. She loves the venue here at Kicking Horse. She's, uh, you know, she's another one who's been running a bit of a uh, a bit of a tough scene this year so far, but coming back to a place that she loves, that's delivered for her in the past. I think we're going to see a strong run out of Jess and a good day. She's excited. She's got her head screwed on right, and she's looking to uh, to put down a big big one today. Yeah, I just popped out for a wee uh, Mimi in the Faripaku, and it is cold out there today. So hopefully those girls haven't been uh, too badly battered by the southerly wind that's blowing across the top of the face. We're going to see an absolute throwdown here at the ozone face on Kicking Horse Mountain. It's a beautiful day to be out in the mountains. All right, well, the Scott rider, Molly Armanino, is going to be the first one out of the gate. She was absolutely charging last year on the qualifiers, earning her spot. She had an unfortunate frostbite injury. Hopefully her toe's all right in this cold weather, but earning herself a wild card for the Freeride World Tour. And the big scream in the start gate, getting herself fired up. Molly leading the tour and the only one of the ski women guaranteed into finals. I love that, just a big scream. Get the heart going, get yourself pumped up. And she works herself down the ridge here towards the rider's right, lookers left of the venue. Look at that scenery. It was an interesting look into, into the mentality of Molly Armanino, one of the really most self-deprecating riders. Last night at the opening ceremonies, the announcer asked if by coming in in the leader's bib, she was feeling confident. And her answer was very simple and to the point. She said, no. <laughs> yeah, Ricky Diamond's uh, local failed lounge singer really struggling with his questions there as a presenter. But uh, that man sure does know how to entertain. And entertainment we are bound to see. Please stay away from that bus of a cornice. So Molly Armanino coming into this technical entrance. We've seen a bunch of the men go into. She's kind of really known for super technical lines, straight lines, always charging. So Molly looking for this kind of backdoor entrance into the really steep rocky section. We saw Craig Murray go in that way. It's very technical, very tricky. Just Ooh. pointing it out of there. And oh, oh, getting tangled up, little back slap, and then just not able to pull it back together for Molly Armanino. That was bold and in the exact fashion that we have come to expect from Molly. Yeah, I like that line choice, though, uh, of just pointing it out, you know, like, oh, and she goes down again. Some of the chunder there you can see falling from uh, up high has just taken her skis. That's unfortunately going to be a no score there, as we see. I hope she's all right. But I like that, like, the straight line in those tight rocky sections can often be the smarter maneuver. While bold, you know, it's, it's easy to run out of a rock when you're going straight. Yeah, get in and out of there quick. You don't want to spend too much time in those rocky zones. And unfortunately, Molly kind of getting a little bit of a back slap and then just an odd one, the ski getting kind of stolen from her. Now it's just wallowing around in the powder. As you see this side of the face, it's definitely a lot deeper. The wind kind of depositing things. I mean, you see the cornice on the top of that section. There's a reason that's there. The wind comes from that direction. It pushes the snow in. Well, I love these shots. Look at that straight line. Just catching something there, I think. It looked like, kind of gave her like a, maybe something under the snow as she landed on that, just pushing her into the back seat. And then we'll see what stole her ski there. Just a touch out of balance. Ooh. And then a little too aggressively trying to escape from that, uh, from that avalanche debris. You lay on that ski when you're going that fast and put it out of the fall line that hard and unfortunately getting just tossed over the bars. So Molly going to make her way up and grab her ski. So I guess if there's, a, if there's a silver lining for this, Molly does have a guaranteed ticket to Freeride World Tour Finals. So while she is in the hunt for the overall, she still has two second places that are going to count. This is going to be a throwaway result for Molly. So she's still going to be sitting pretty uh, once things shake up after this. Working hard there to get up there nice and quickly. Hope she's doing all right. The frustration's got to be built there by now, but um, we're going to see plenty more from this very talented rider in the rest of the tour stops this year. And um, hopefully she can get that back on and uh, get some power turns in the way out. A little redemption turn, you know? Yeah, sometimes you just need to get the spirit back up after after a tough one like that. So Molly Armanino going down, that's going to be a no score for her. And that will uh, that will count as her throwaway result. Still scoring two second places from the first two stops. So the uh, rookie 
out of South Lake Tahoe. Unfortunate end in, to her day, but it's not going to bother her too much as she is moving on to Freeride World Tour Finals as we go back up to our next rider in the gate, Justine Dufour-Lapointe. She is holding on to a grip of hardware, an Olympic gold medal, an Olympic silver medal in moguls for Team Canada. In Canada, she is an absolute hero in the ski world and even transcends that. Living in Montreal, so she's not even based in the mountains. But she kind of had a big splash at the beginning for, for uh, wild carded onto the tour from her freestyle background. Massive backflip in the first event, uh, which we kind of all expected, but then the free ride elements of her skiing really shining through in the rest of that first run and in the, her second run in Andorra where she took the win. So sitting second overall, Justine dufour lapoin on course here at Kicking Horse. That's a beautiful pronunciation you've got there, and I will be definitely trying to leave that to you, as that is not my strong suit with the uh, Francais. She's working her way out to the lookers right. We've seen very few riders go here, so it's going to be interesting to see which line choice she makes. Again, on this kind of Sugar City Traverse, the riders aren't really being judged until they get over and start their drop-in line uh, properly. So she works her way over. Another little pole clack there, you know, just keeping the spirits high. Yeah, Justine, definitely a great spirit. She's been loving her transition into freeride. Just loving the spirit, the community, an extremely exposed traverse here as she gets over the top of it. She's got the skills and the talent coming from the World Cup mogul background, knows how to turn a ski, getting things kicked off on this air. A mm. little bit punchy there. Looks like definitely the snow conditions over on this side a little less consistent. Yeah, but you could see, I mean, Landing in hard icy mogul, she put that one down absolutely bolts, getting that next one going a little back there, but just holding on nicely and controlling that speed. Beautiful cutback turn there, throwing the spray up, working her way down his own. We've yet to see really much traffic on, but this is an ear below it that we love to see. We've seen great success here from riders in the past. Yeah, extremely technical approach. Justine pointing it, clearing the rocks, bit of a back slap there, <laughs> but she's out, arms up as that, uh, that section of the mountain definitely a little firmer than we see on the other side. But Justine coming out of it clean. De Judge is definitely going to notice the back slap. But all in all, technically solid run for Justine dufour Lapointe. I think really smart skiing as well. She's managed to find three good ears, some great turns, some cinematic skiing. She looks stoked. She should be. Great to see knee pad uh, designs coming back into outer wear, you know. It's great to track what these knees are doing. She's a happy chappy. Yeah, the peak performance rider there just waving to the crowd. Oh, that is so big. <laughs> She's coming for more mental, you know. She's hungry for that, isn't she? Once more, once more. Who doesn't? You just heard her say that was so big. As the riders, you know, they're scoping this visually, and there's always that moment where you get into the air where you're like, oh, what have I done? <laughs> <laughs> what decisions in my life led me here? Look at that angle, that's great. Getting a bit of a wheelie on the skis, but fights back into the front seat. Mogul Ski is obviously always in the front of their boots. She's fought there, she comes back, big air out the bottom. Yeah. Hand down, back slap there, but look at that, the joy exploding out of her. You love to see that expression. Oh yeah, and you could see that one, the lip on the takeoff just had a little bit of kick, so just in getting pushed. Him. Pushed all good. slightly Woo. back. She's all good. Thanks, her mom Canada. nervously Thanks, watching Canada. at home. Her, her, I think her mom's been a little bit less behind the transition to free ride as uh, unfamiliar to a lot of people in Quebec. But Justine really bringing free ride into the Quebec ski community. So that's exciting for them. So she's going to be first right now with a 75 3 3. A solid score there. The judge is loving that line. Yeah, a very solid score. And with the fall in the first place, this is the first properly ranked uh, run. So this is the bar that the rest of the riders will be ranked against. And she has set that bar very high. Right, well, Justine taking her place in the hot seat. She's going to be hoping to hold that down for a long time. But of course, a talented field of women still stacked up at the top. Going to be looking to push her out of the Tina Sire hot seat. Has Justine <laughs> settling in? Yeah, giving it a little pat. I'd like to know what kind of like uh, animal skin they have on that seat. What are they running there? Some, some caribou, maybe? Caribou gone? All right, well, we head back up another member of the Tahoe crew, 19 years old, one year out of junior on the qualifiers and finding herself in the start gate at the Free Ride World Tour, Delilah Quinn, unfortunately suffering a, a back injury just before the Andorra stop and a, unable to compete, so she had to withdraw from that. She said she's 
better than she was there, but still not quite riding at 100%. So hopefully Delilah is going to feel comfortable enough to put down a solid run here on the ozone face of Kicking Horse. Heading out to that skier's right zone. Let's see what hey there Delilah's got for us. Yeah, it's always tough when your your body doesn't cooperate with your schedule. <laughs> it's a reasonably important part of being able to ski. I've unfortunately dinged myself one too many times as well, so hopefully she's feeling all fired up, making some beautiful turns down through the power there, lining up in air, getting that takeoff, putting it down clean. Oh, you got to love thro throwing a few buckies in the air, eh? Look at that. Just enjoying the ski. It looks like she's having some fun. I'm really excited to see what she makes of this lower zone here. There's some big ears possible as she works her way through this zone. Yeah, kind of checking up, getting out here onto the rider's right and coming into this set track. Delilah taking off, clearing the rocks, nice and clean. So Delilah having a great start to her run and one more feature below her. She wants more. She's got it off the nose there. Oh, I shouldn't have said it. Oh, the I buck shouldn't have said it. Just coming out of that back slap, it's, it's so hard when you bounce up from a back slap to stay centered in the fall line and unfortunately just getting pushed off to the side and Delilah losing a ski on that oh, one. No. So that is going to be a no score for the young rookie. 19 years old, I have a lot of faith that we're going to see plenty of Delilah Quinn in our future. I love this top section. Fluid, strong skiing, laying nice turns, throwing the spray out. This transition, I like this, just like pin that there and straight into a nice turn, you know, like showing that control, showing that technique. This bottom one, just getting a little back, getting bucked. With the way that we have the snow kind of funneling down, sometimes it builds these sort of banks and it can be really inconsistent and a lot firmer and you're setting your stance as you take off. Once you're in the air, you can't quite tell until you hit the ground. Yeah, and with, uh, as you said, with that slough cone there, the snow rolling away on both sides, so just tipping out of that back slap. We saw Justine able to come out of the back slap dead square and over her feet, but with the, with the shape of that for Delilah, unfortunately going down, and Delilah one who needed a big result mm. uh, here to put herself onto the good side of the cut. So unfortunate there for the young rider, but only 19 years old, and as I said, one year out of juniors. So a bright future for the young Tahoe rider. Yeah, I definitely think, as we cut back to a shot of the face, you can see we've got a little bit of cloud cover there, but the viz is still good for the riders. As we look up to Jessica Hotter, says Triple Code New Zealand, but she's from the North Island, Aukuni, I believe. Having made her way down south, Jess has put on an absolute show the last few years. I've loved watching her development as a rider. Huge fan of her skiing and just such a lovely person as well. Yeah, huge fan of her personality, her spirit, and Jess Hodder, the reigning freeride world tour champion. And this has oh. been, oh, the mouth the guard mouth going guard in. in. Jess she Hodder is means business out here on the ozone face. The last time she competed here, she won. Um, she's had just such a great string of results here on Ozone and, and in her freeride world to her career. One of the strongest skiers, another one who can bend a ski. The, yeah. She's got that perfect freeride blend of the full send mentality, but great technique to back it up. Yeah, growing up in the North Island, she is no stranger to variable conditions. That is probably one of the toughest places to learn to ski with immensely icy slopes most of the time and hideously volcanic rock. Jess Hodder does need a big result here, but I have maximum faith in her ability. She's been spending a lot of time filming with the Blank crew, and I'm really excited to see what those guys have been putting together. Fast, fluid skiing. She's been working on an aerial game as well, with some great tricks and style. Just really trying to pull all those skills together, and we're down at crunch time. I'd love to know what she's listening to. DMX, maybe? Maybe, yeah. Some hype-up music to get her fired up for this run as Jess Hodder just getting ready to light it up. She's uh, pretty much looking for the win. That's going to be that's gonna be uh, what, what Jess Hodder's got in her mind. She had a great run going in Andorra. All the pieces clicking, and unfortunately, on her last huge air at the bottom, suffering from a front punch in that variable snow condition. So she's just getting ready to get herself, uh, get herself out of the start gate and down to business here on the ozone face. You can see her just singing along. <laughs> oh man, I 
hopefully I'm thinking in the future like we're all going to be chip riders thanks to Elon Musk and we'll just literally have like a visual representation of what is going through Jess Hodder's mind right now. I am super fired up about this. Well, I would love to get a look inside Jess Hodder's head. She's always one. She, she kind of <laughs> <laughs> downplays her ability and, and, and really sells herself short. But Jess Hodder, you got a couple of fans here in the booth and a ton of fans out there in Freeride World. Big hauler as Jess Hodder, reigning Freeride World Tour champion, kicking out of the gate. Yeah, here we go. Making her way down the center of the venue. It's great to see some variety in line choices here. Look at that shot. Wouldn't it be nice just to be like the drone pilot just for like one run just to get this ultimate shot the whole way down? Great skiing from Jess, just beautiful turns. She's working her way out towards Sugar City. Yeah, so as we've heard, this section is going to be kind of a little bit of leeway from the judges for not going super fast. It is extremely rocky and technical, very thin as that side angle wind has kind of scoured the slope. It's definitely put snow in places, but it's removed snow from other places. So just, just being sensible and careful to get across to kind of the meat of her run as she comes across. And now we're going to see things start in earnest for Jess Hodder. Taking this first air, similar to what we saw with Justine, putting it down nice and clean. Making her way through some little Christmas trees. Oh, just fond, fond memories of her absolutely obliterating this tree, landing on it last time, getting off it there, clean again, fluid through this section of tight, nasty little knee biter trees. Yeah, making and these turns look pretty. Jess is above a meaty chunk of this competition face as she comes down into this tree section. There's only one way out as you come down. There's a couple of tracks. Jess making her way in. She's going to have to release from the fall line as she does. Same zone as we saw Justine DuPont nah. and Jess going down, landing directly in the bomb hole made by Justine dufour Lapont and just not able to hold onto it. That was a heavy impact for the champ. Unintentional screaming semen there in the run out. That is absolute heartbreak. Hands to the sky. Competition free riding it can just be so brutal. You don't know exactly where that landing is when you can't see it, especially like a fadeaway takeoff like that. You have to hold your speed to get there and just unfortunately stuffing it into the bomb hole. I did that myself just the other day. It's so hard to, to avoid when you can't know exactly where that is. So we look at it again. Yeah, we see Jess's approach, and there's not a lot of options for takeoff angle as she drops into Justine's track, and there's no other way for her, no other place for her to land than directly into that impact mark. So Justine packing down the snow when she landed, and so instead of powder, uh, Jess landing in a much firmer surface, and that is a heartbreaker for Jess Hodder. Oh. Well. So that is competition free ride, unfortunately. I hope she's going to keep her turn up because we know, I mean, this is our reigning free ride world tour champion. Too humble for her own good. There is all the future in the world for her in this sport. And I cannot wait to see what she's been doing in the back country with the blank crew. Great to see some support here from the riders. So those two have become fast friends. Justine Dufour Lapointe going down to New Zealand in the summer to do a four-star event and a two-star, and her and Jess immediately clicking. They've been uh, travel companions on the Freeride World Tour, and you saw them sharing a line there. But we go straight back up to Whistler Freeride Club alum, Whistler's own peak performance rider, Olivia McNeil. Olivia going absolutely haywire in Andorra with one of the biggest airs of the entire day, all fields considered. And now she is another one looking for a big result here as she wants to get herself onto the good side of the cut. We've got that tie for fourth between Elizabeth and Sibyl. So Eliz uh, sorry, Olivia heading out here to the skier's right. Seems like uh, from what we've seen so far, this side delivering a bit more of a pleasant riding experience for, for the athletes. Yeah, it's definitely been a trade-off. You know, it's a, it's a shorter side of the venue. You can stack the features, but it is incredibly tight, precise skiing. So it's kind of, to me, it's, it's kind of all or nothing, you know. It goes well or it really doesn't. But I think Olivia's looking calm, collected, skiing nicely along the ridge here. And I'm expecting big things. She's had some reasonably consistent results, but here today it's crunch time and she needs the big one. 
Yeah, so that poppy style, just really trying to get her mind and body into the run because as soon as you get to the cornice, it is fully on. So a few pops around the or along the ridge top to get the get the legs fired up and get your brain into send mode. Exactly, and that's one of the tough things with these is sometimes you got, you've been on top, you got cold legs, and you're just starting with a bang right away. She's working down and towards this rocky section here. We've got some tracks for her to follow. It's tough to make sure you get the right takeoff. Uh, putting it into a double there with a turn in the middle and now catching on to this track as Olivia moving on to this bulky feature landing. Oh, just holding on to it, almost getting folded there, cr trying to get across the channel and she does. <laughs> just maximum fight from this battler, just working her way through that. That was some technical stuff and some tricky conditions with those tra with those tracks earlier, having knocked a bunch of the snow out of the way and railroading you somewhat. When you got deep, cold snow like this, those tracks can be a real hindrance. And she just fought through that really strong performance there. And we saw that channel gap gobble up Jamessa Hampton earlier. Olivia, it really looked like both of them had a hard time actually carrying speed into it with enough pace to actually get over it, catching the uphill side, but just handling it with the full length of travel in her legs. So Olivia going in for a hug there with the peak performance teammate, Matchy Matchy there in those white suits. As we cut back to the top for a bit of a close up with the drone, slightly rocky takeoff there and just getting it dialed nice as she works back left, finding that uh, takeoff, getting the other area. You can see bucked a little bit, but just strong to stay over her skis, works across the hill, catching like a redirect side hill landing. Like that is tough and just handling it. Yeah, I guess she wanted to step it up from the flat landing in Andorra into an <laughs> uphill landing here at Kicking Horse, but managing to uh, managing to hold on to it. Uh, all the criteria lit up in green there. So a couple little issues there for, for Olivia, but clean so far. And moving into second with a 70.67, just almost exactly halfway through the ski women's field. So we're gonna see what the other riders have to say on that one. But that was a strong one for Olivia McNeil and a real testament to spending some time in the gym before the season. Make sure that core is strong as the uh, ground is gonna try to steal your skis out from under you. Yeah, she works out. There's been some gains there for sure just maxing that leg power to power through those tough sections. Kind of almost bringing like an urban redirect with that channel landing. Yeah, yeah cat-like reflexes there as we move back up to the start. A Chamonix local here, Megan Beton, Dynastar rider. She's, uh, you know, she's a professional ski instructor and she's running the controls on the Aiguille de Midi all summer long. Megan Beton, she's had a bit of a struggle early on. She had a great season on the Challenger last year and with a 10th and a 5th, so Megan looking for a big result here. She wants to get her spot cemented into the Freeride World Tour Finals. Megan kicking out of the gate, doing it for the French crew. Yeah, she has a 10th and a 5th so far, so we'll be looking to improve in that 10th, and I think we've got a good chance of that today with where we are in the pack. Strong skiing. See where she makes, she's gone a more central line. Really nice turns here, finding some good power. Making it look good, fluid. Just look at that power. Yeah, charging through this section as she comes past this upper little zone that's eaten up a few riders. A oh. unique take on it and a really, really sensible move there. Strong riding here for Megan Beton as she has got the pedal to the metal coming into this lower section. I don't know if I'd call any of this sensible. This is fast, fluid, aggressive, four-line skiing. Holy moly, look at that section. Just Race that. Turning Lightning. it into a triple there for Megan Baton. Exactly what she needed to do. And I she is going to be fired up. Yeah, using every ounce of that technique she's got and firing yeah. into the finish. You can see her hand just a fist pump there. She is going to be elated with that run. That was charging top to bottom skiing for Megan Baton. Big, big deliverance here from Megan. Under the gun, under the pressure, she has come out firing. Beautiful skiing. Look at the way she controls this. Straight across the fall line, into good turns, through a technical section, lines it up, gets the air. She set herself perfectly to hit this. Rock hits her skis. She doesn't give a... She is just pointing it. That 
is pure free ride skiing. You can tell that is a Chamonix woman with a ton of power. Yeah, that line tracker just showing pure fall line and the oh. fluidity oh. absolutely maxing out the top of the scale. Megan Baton, the Dynastar rider, absolutely flying. Yeah, you can see on her base there a big chunk taken out. You saw it almost going to unintentional iron cross, <laughs> but Megan holding on to it, super strong. Another rider has put the hours in at the gym to be able to hold on to those moments. I'm a big fan of that. I am a big, big fan of that. All right, well, score and there dropping it is. 82 for Megan Baton, and she slides into the hot seat. So Megan doing exactly what she needed to do here at Kicking Horse. She needed a big run, and she delivered it there, top to bottom. Absolutely, you nailed it, Sam. Free ride skiing to a tee. That, that like gives me chills. You love the emotion. You love this. Like, this is competition free ride at its best. Super big result, super necessary, and she just delivered in tough conditions. I love the way she, she set up for that triple. Strong skiing into it, but then just kept it full line, set herself up for success, and held on. Didn't even look that hard. Like, beautifully graceful, strong skiing. Well, straight back up Jeez. to the top, already dropping in Sun Valley, <laughs> a Sun Valley rider, Addison Rafford. She's already got a win and then a tough crash in Andorra. So she's, uh, you know, she's definitely cemented her spot here in the Freeride World Tour with a great result right out of the gate. A another young rookie making a big splash in this talented field here on the Freeride World Tour. She's rides with so much style always and uh, just a pleasure to watch her ski. Yeah, getting the grabs in those earlier events, really going for those bonus points. Great first air, super fluid off the top there, working her way down, getting the next one, putting it to her feet clean. Yeah. She's making a case. Nice little grab there for Addie Rafford as she Ooh. comes way across to the skier's right into this section across the gully and she's got a bunch oh. of features underneath her and some really, really nice looking snow. As she gets on top of this channel, Moving down into the lower section, you can see a couple of those bomb holes from earlier riders, turning it into a double. Addy Rafford taking that one long and super clean. Nice, creative choice there. Taking that earlier inches with the corners and working it back through. Completely new line we've seen from any rider today. Finding some nice snow, finding some good features, putting smart, strong skiing to the, cat, to the fore. Yeah, really, really, really strong run. Addy Rafford, another one coming out of the freestyle world into free ride, and then took a little break from it after a couple a couple goes on the qualifier. Came back to it last year with a kind of new mindset and really seeing that she's carried that into her free ride world tour journey. That great run from Addison Rafford. <laughs> really different run from what we saw earlier in the season. Let's take another look at this top bit. Super fluid off the top on a blind air, which is really hard because you can't see stuff all. Finds the next one, goes for that right-handed safety grab as well and just works it back across the hill. Yeah, I'd say bringing a, a more chargey element into her riding than we saw earlier on. And that one, she carried so far off the second stage of that double. A really, really strong run. So ski women, as we've come to expect, just delivering every time this field heads out of the start gate. They're just firing. And Addison Rafford making a strong case for herself. It's going to be interesting to see what the judges make of that. Big fan of those white mitts there. Just, uh, I think it's sort of almost a blowback to like the mobile scene of like showing your knees. She's got the white gloves, showing she's going for that grabs. A little bit of a highlighter on that. That is a great way for Rise to add bonus points to show style, to show control in these tough lines. Well, and Addison, both on snow and off snow, just oozing style in everything she does, and definitely doing that on the face here, getting the grab on that air and then into that, that double. Really, really technical to get into it, you can see, and then pinning it off the second stage, loving that. I think smart line choice as well, when you consider how many... Ooh. Okay, so we are getting a look at exactly what the judges are looking at right now as the judges 
locking in on all of the elements, matching up the riding against the criteria. This is their, their kind of opportunity to have a replay. It's a really valuable tool for the judges. As Addison Rafford into second with a 77, so the hard charging style, they're paying off for Addy, but a big threat fended off for the lady in the hot seat there, Megan Baton. So Addy moving into second, she's gonna be looking at a spot on the podium if she can. Yeah, indeed. Judges cutting me off there in the middle of my sentence, which they love to do, and it's probably a wise idea. But what I was trying to say was smart line choice at the end of this big field of riders, finding a fresh line, finding fresh snow. All right, well, we are heading back up to the top. She is the 2021 Freeride World Champion. Her uh, last result here was fifth. She's sitting in fifth right now, actually in a fourth place tie with fellow Verbier compatriot, Sibylle Blanjean, Elizabeth Gerritsen, always stylish, always a different take on the face. It feels like the Verbier riders just have a style that kind of carries out of their background from Verbier. Having spent uh, half of my life in Verbier, I think it's one of the greatest places to learn freeride. And Elizabeth has been a real student of the sport. I love her style, it's very quiet. She's a small rider, but it's very powerful skiing. Smooth, stylish, creative lines, and big ears. It's, it's, it's kind of almost like one of those rides, again, light running, like makes things look easy. Yeah, and, and always really fast. You know, you can count on Elizabeth yeah. for a high-speed run. And then straight away, you know, backing straight that up, away. pinned off the cornice there coming into this section. We're seeing a few more tracks in this section. We saw it pay off for Megan Baton. Elizabeth taking a very similar approach, stomping on that one. Really good flow here, like through a technical section, keeping the skis moving, beautiful technique. Really strong riding, very clear and precise to where she's going, working towards a similar line, taking it back across the hill towards the double, similar line choice. So smooth, so strong, Elizabeth Gerritsen. A solid, solid run for the Verbier rider, the 2021 world champion, Elizabeth ooh, Gerritsen, ooh. making it look quick and easy. And we know it's not easy as we've seen this face yeah. taking no prisoners out there today. A really, really solid run for the peak performance rider out of Verbier. Uh, I'm a huge fan of her skiing. I love watching what she does out there. Really great line choice, I think. Really smart skiing. She looks happy. She definitely should be. This is great. Again, setting herself up, up for success, taking a slightly different approach, getting that across hill, showing the control with the turn. Clean, smooth, aggressive, four line skiing, and just dialing it in. Yeah, I think maybe one point of difference there on the approach to that line between Elizabeth and Megan Baton, there was an extra turn out of that upper air where Megan went dead fall line and kind of taking it as a triple. Elizabeth really locking in that control turn, but then you saw it on the on the run out, she was fully in control, standing yeah. directly over her feet. So different approach, not better or worse, but just a, a little bit of a different look at it. So Elizabeth oh! into second with a 79.67. So a really strong score there for the Swiss rider. Big hug for her friend and fellow uh, competitor, Megan Baton, as we now have uh, Megan guaranteed to be on the podium. Wow. And actually, Elizabeth also guaranteed to be on the podium with only one rider to come here in the ski women's field. But this is another big threat. The women really delivering here in tough conditions. It's so hard to go as one of the last divisions when there's so many tracks, there's been so much damage done to this ozone face. Elizabeth, under pressure, getting that result and really driving her case home. We know she's so good in those final two stops. Yeah, absolutely, and that's where she wants to uh, she wants to get herself into that position where she can go home to Verbier and lock down another win. She's got one under her belt. And speaking of victories on the Bec de Ross, this young lady has one in her rookie season, taking the win last year at home. A really special moment for her, and uh, a you know solid slew of results so far with a third and a fourth. Has her tied with Elizabeth Gerritsen in the overall standings. So Sibylle Blanchon, she was really nervous this morning, just kind of feeling the pressure of the cut and everything she said she wasn't really scared of her run but just scared of the bigger picture and it's hard for riders to tune that out and just focus in on what's directly in front of you 
It really is. There are so many uh, extra forces at play here. It's not just your riding ability. This is the big show. This is the big time. It's crunch time on the Ferrari World Tour. We've seen her deliver huge performances under pressure. She's fired up in the start gate. I can't wait. Well, she is out of the gate and on course here on the Ozone Face, and another rider opting to go out here to the right. Season number two on the Freeride World Tour for Sibylle Blanjon. And so far, so good for this young Swiss rider, as she has definitely cemented her case as a tour rider. The last rider in the division with 82 points to take the top spot. She's working her way to the skiers' right, where we've seen a lot of high points delivered. I'm really interested to see what she makes of this. There's still plenty of good lines there, but there's also... I'm going to stop that sentence before I even finish it. Yeah, so Sabil just making her way down the corners with a good head of steam. You know, we, we see the riders just really trying to get into the run and going even further than we've seen most riders go. We saw Olivia out in this section earlier on, and now Sabil coming in with a charging style that she's become known for. Yeah, coming from Verbier, charging is the mentality there, set by many years of high-performing throw. And look at that agility, finding both those cliffs. Fighting through that tough landing, getting another air out the bottom, super strong skiing there, into the shade, firing out the bottom. Yeah, really direct line <laughs> there for Sibylle Blanjon. She does not mess around. She kept it in the fall line, which has uh, proven to be a winning formula here today on the Ozone Face at Kicking Horse. You don't want to get your skis too sideways on this one. She didn't really bother. Not fast. Fall line, aggressive, fast skiing straight down the hill, in, out, job, done. Yeah, that was an aggressive run from the Swiss rider. Second year on the tour. You can see her just stopping the music there. She's going to have a chat. Well, <laughs> <laughs> seems mildly non fast It's just another day in the office for Sibyl. Look at that, fighting through the rocks and just putting it down. I love the strength shown there, like little bit of a control issue on that landing, but just back in the front of her boot straight away. Great angle as we see this here. Yeah, and able to fight through the landing on this one to direct herself still down to the next feature. So McGon watching anxiously as the last possible challenger for her spot on the hot seat made their way down that line tracker showing just how direct Sibyl's line was as she nervously waits for the score. Nervous moments as well for Megan Baton. Uh, I do not envy either of them. There's a lot at stake here. You can kind of see it on the face. The judges are going back up just to check something here. A lot to like about this run though. They're rewinding her up the hill. I've never seen someone ski backwards so fast in free ride. Ultimate switch skiing there up the hill as they're just winding it back. This tool extremely valuable for the judges to get looks at the details. They're going to be having a look at that one. Stage one, stage two, stage three, backslap. You know, a little deduction for each of those things, but the rest of, uh, of Sabil's run so solid. What I liked about that is she immediately did get back in the front of the the front of her boots, put the skis across, got that kind of bonus air out the bottom and just kept it moving and showed her strength. Look at the fluidity there, very high. Control a little down. Let's see what the judges make of it. Yeah, uh, for sure going to be a little ding with that back slap and especially in a field that's had some really, really clean runs there. They, you know, perfection is what matters here. The uh, judges really considering where they want to slide that one into. I feel for it. You can see the emotion. She wants it. We know she can perform in the final stop. Verbier is at home. That's where she wants to go. That's where we've seen her shine. Home, home on the range, sensible there. <laughs> Such intense moments. This crunch time event where, with the cut looming above everything like a big gray cloud, it's so intense. And you can see she's just like kind of got her fingers and toes and everything crossed that the score is going to come in to put her where she needs to be. And if anyone has actually tried, it's immensely hard to cross your toes in a ski boot. Those will be performance fit for the performance that she needs, that she's shown on the space day. She's made her case. It is a tough place to be in. I feel for her right now. I am much happier freezing my butt off in the commentator's tent right now. Uh, intense moments and the ski women delivering once again right up to their full capabilities across the board. So many strong runs 
as we're uh, we're just seeing the judges really kind of taking their time with the scores, wanting to, you know, this is extremely, extremely important and they want that accuracy. We're watching exactly what the judges are seeing, having a look at that channel gap from Olivia McNeil. So I think they're deciding which one of those is gonna come out on top. So many factors go into the judging, those five categories, so critical as we come down to these kind of crunch moments in, uh, in the ski women's field. Yeah, that's the really tough thing. Uh, here we have the here score go, dropping 69.3, sixth position for Sibyl Blanjean. So Sibyl not stoked with that one, 69.33 as she heads out. So that means that this woman is going to be a first time free ride world tour winner, Megan Baton delivering on the day as we see what the ski women's field gave to us today. Megan Baton, the French rider out of Chamonix with an 82 taking the win. Elizabeth Gerritsen, Addison Rafford, and the two Canadians there rounding out the top five. Justine and Olivia Sibyl Blanjon, Jess Hodder unfortunately going down in that bomb hole. And Delilah and Molly Armanino having a tough day out here on the ozone face. So uh, uh, once again, heartbreak and glory in the ski women's field as the ozone face taking no prisoners across the board. It's just so tight when it gets down to these things. You can see the disappointment on Sibyl and it's contrasted with the absolute joy of Megan. Massive congratulations to that rider. Well, let's see, because this is gonna be a huge shakeup, what this has done to our overall ranking and the cut. We see Addison Rafford taking on the golden bib as tour leader, Molly Armanino bumping down to second, Justine Dufort Lapointe, Elizabeth Gerritsen jumping way up, and Megan Beton sliding into that last qualifying spot for the free ride world tour finals. Unfortunately, everything below fifth is gonna be looking at heading on to the challenger tour, Sibyl there at the end, Olivia McNeil and the other riders. So here are your top three from the free ride world tour here at Kicking Horse in Golden, BC. Megan Baton, a first time winner on the free ride world tour and delivering under pressure today. That to me is one of the massive stories of today. Megan Baton absolutely putting one down pinpoint aggressive pure free ride skiing and getting it done when she absolutely had to. A huge result for the French rider taking the win here and moving herself up and on to the next two stops in the free ride world tour finals. Fieberbrun and Verbier coming up and we are going to head down into the finish area to check in with Megan Beton. Megan, your first win on the Free Ride World Tour, and you did it on a day where you had to do that. Tell us about your mindset coming in and choosing that line. What an incredible performance. <laughs> Thanks, Derek. Uh, I knew I have to do uh, one or, or two to qualify for the final. So I went uh, go big or go home. Huh? <laughs> and uh, I'm stoked that it worked. <laughs> All right, well, Megan Beton delivering on the day. Huge congratulations for the Dynastar rider. A great performance under incredible pressure. What a fantastic run, Sam. You said pure free ride, top to bottom, absolutely pinned and just delivering under such an intense pressure situation. Megan Beton, kicking horse champion. Well, that's 
a wrap on all the skiing here at Kicking Horse Golden BC, but we are not done. We still have a whole category of snowboarding to come. The snowboard women, the last field dropping today, and there's a lot to play for. We're going to take a look here at the overall situation. Big picture right now, Katie Anderson just having her way with it this year. Two comps, two wins, coming out swinging. Anna Orlova with a great comeback, and Estelle Rosolio, the rookie on the tour, sitting on the good side of the cut, but it is extremely tight between her and Tiffany Paraton, and then Michaela Davis Meehan, she is an absolute sender. She's had two tough finishes, but you know, we've seen her deliver absolutely banging free ride competition runs, so anything is possible as we just saw with Megan Baton in the ski women's field. Let's take a look at the order they're dropping in. So we have Mika uh, Michaela Davis Meehan starting things off. Uh, Estelle Rizzolio, Tiffany Periton, and all over, and then Katie Anderson. So we have five riders today. There is all to play for. It's going to be incredibly interesting to see what these riders do with this space as the last riders of the day. Will they go all in for the big win, or will they try and play a smart tactical game? Well, I think we're going to see a range through those strategies. I think this woman is going to be going all out because for her, a win is what it's going to take for her to get into the finals. We're going to take a look at what you thought at home in the Peak Performance Fun Bet. Katie Anderson with a resounding vote from the fans at home. 88% of you. Tiffany Perrotin, 75%. And the rookie Estelle, Estelle Rizzolio locking in 60% of the vote in the Peak Performance Fun Bets. So uh, Tiffany Perrotin, she is reigning Freeride World Tour Champion right now. 75% of you expect to see her on the podium today. Yeah, and it's going to be great. I think the thing from Michaela here is that it's simple. She's got to go large. She's got to put it down. It is all on here. We know she's a great rider, and it's going to be super interesting to see which feature she goes to, what part of the zones, and how she does it. Yeah, Michaela has relocated from Australia to Revelstoke for the winter. Revelstoke having a great uh, great season so far. I've seen her throwing huge 360s off cliffs. It's in her pocket if she can just lock down a full run today, but it's not going to be easy, and not just because it's difficult to do it, but because the rest of the field is so strong. And we do have to mention Erica Vikander, who's a strong uh, rider in this field, had guiding obligations in Japan, so not able to show up here for this stop. So, Erica, we miss you in the field, but Michaela Davis Meehan is going to hold it down here and kick things off for the snowboard women. A little throw of hands there. Let's see how keen she is to throw hands with the Sozone face and take it to it. Working her way out to the riders right there. Going to be down the ridge. There's been a lot of good scoring runs. I know I've said that too many times already, but I've started to run out of words. I've just kind of had my face melted off me today. A little trickier when you're on a snowboard with this flat section and also just with the blind roll away. Going to see what she makes of these corners entries. Definitely adding another sort of element to be considered for the riders. Yeah, and Michaela riding regular foot, so she's got her back to the cornice, which has got to feel a little nerve-wracking, just kind of knowing exactly where your heel side, is, uh, heel side edge is in relation to that big looming cornice. And we saw, you know, chunks of it cracking off in some of the other fields, so you definitely want to give it some space. Yeah, I would say Michaela's looking to crack one off herself here as she works her way out towards this entrance. Oh, yes! I oh. like this, I like this. Over Getting the right into the steep exposure. Strong toe side turn towards this mandatory ear. Putting it down, lining up another one. Come on. Yes, yeah, strong riding. Fluidly into the apron, finding some nice snow there. Really strong start there. Yeah, banging it off, right off the top, aggressive, and then into the pow fields. I think there's a, there's a, really, uh, a really wise move here for Michaela, staying out of that slough path, the Abbey debris, and riding the powder out. Two big stomps off big features right off the top to get the snowboard women's category cracking. It's really tough going first because you are the bar that the rest of them will be rated against. Strong, I would say pretty faultless riding. Uh, good line choice and really fluid as well, which I like to see. No messing around here for this gal. No, that was exactly what she needed to do. She chose a line where the snow was good. She wasn't messing around with sharks. Two big features and then a clean run out through the powder. So Michaela Davis Meehan making a strong case for herself. I like this here. Just getting it done, finding that clean takeoff, reaching for the grab. Can't quite see if she gets that on the backside there across the slope. 
big air, finding a nice clean landing, strong riding into this power field, throwing up the spray and the hands. She's here to fight. And not even a moment of worry. There was no, nothing, nothing about that run that wasn't flawless. So Michaela doing exactly what she needed to do <laughs> under pressure, blowing kisses to the crowd. They love you out there. Michaela Davis, me, and now going to wait to put down, or wait for the judges to put down their score and the score that the other riders are going to be looking to achieve. Yeah, she needs a big result here, but she has absolutely made a strong case for this, delivering under pressure like we saw in the last division. The nervous wait for her begins. It's kind of nice though when you, you get it done. You've made there's nothing else she could do. Like she's put her case out there, made a strong, strong start to this division. All on the judges now. I loved Lily Bradley's take on on that feeling when she was oh the ju the judges absolutely loving that. Yeah, Lily Bradley saying when you cross through that big FWT arch at the bottom, it's like exiting from a haunted house that you've been stuck in, and just the feeling of relief. <laughs> and elation that you get to feel once you're in that finish area, especially with a really good run behind you, is, uh, I mean, that's that's the, the feeling these riders are chasing. So we have the score, 83-3-3, a massive score for the first rider of the day in the snowboard women's field, Michaela davis mean and yep. doing exactly what she needed, the Aussie rider taking her spot in the hot seat. I kept my speculation, kept my speculation to myself oh, this time. So nice. I was thinking 80. The judges I agreed. I love it when I'm right. It's so nice. Feels good to be right. We go right back up. Estelle Rosolio. She's a DJ. She's a coder. 37 years old. She's been a fixture on the qualifying tour. Loving being on the free ride world tour of kind of finding her home in the in the family her and the other snowboard women have been rallying around up here at kicking horse enjoying the powder and uh, really looking forward to her she's got that go big mentality too seems to be kind of uh, something in the water in france that just gets gets you sandy never been a fan of the uh, water in france myself but she's got a third and a fourth and i think she's going to be going for the top spot because that's what she's here to do, right? Absolutely, yeah. And she had she had a, a big send in the first event that kind of didn't work out. And then in the last event, just toning it down, it's hard for riders to find that line. How much do you need to go? How much can you stick? You know, when you're up yeah, at face check and you're looking at a run, if it's a 100% chance of stomping, mm. maybe it's not quite enough. Exactly. If you're looking at a 50-50 dice roll, maybe it's too much. So finding that kind of mm. clean balance with a run you can stick, but still enough to get to uh, blow the judge's mops off, then you're going to be looking. Uh, yeah, you're going to be looking to find that delicate balance. And Estelle finding it in Andorra, and she's going to be on the hunt for it here today. Yeah, especially when you got a bunch of mops like the judges we have with only one set of decent hair on Rachel Croft. The rest of them looking like a motley crew. But they're doing a great job here today and in tough conditions. I'd hate to be a judge. It's also hard when you're one of the earlier riders to pick that balance because you don't have anything much to gauge it against. She might have seen Michaela's run there. She knows she's got to go big. But it's really hard finding the line. Let's see what she makes of this. Well, Estelle Rosolio getting ready to kick off her campaign here, kicking horse, and she is out of the gate and on the face. Working your way into more of the central zone here. Look at that beautiful golden BC scenery. Bit of chatter there on the board. This place has been fairly hacked up, and the wind has definitely played quite an effect here on the snow as she makes her way into the meat of this run. Yeah, especially on the ridge top. So Estelle airing off the cornice, and now this is where that ridge top snow that's been scoured from there has been deposited. So a little bit of a nicer riding surface. Uh, Estelle stacking up the features, keeping it pinned, getting heel side there, disappearing into the pow cloud. Potentially missing a spot there that she was looking to hit as she struggled to hold that turn, but strong riding as she works her way across the zone really milking the turns here and finding some nice snow which is tough at this end of the venue coming into a more technical zone you can see her scoping where she's going to entrance into this zone but we've seen some great riding from the women before yeah this zone really delivering for the ski women and oh. estelle now keeping it pointed in the fall line turning it into a double and now zooming out on the long powder apron just leaving that beautiful straight line track behind her pinned into the finish very different approach from what we saw from Michaela. Four line, technical in, in through the section with plenty of rock and small tree features, finding a nice couple of airs, keeping it in the four line, staying away from trouble, 
not potentially quite as much air, a very different approach, but very interesting riding and a strong, faultless style. Yeah, those heel side turns in the top, you can see her completely disappear into the cloud. One toe side turn and then pointing it off the nose in this. A nice clean run out for Estelle. So again, judges are going to have their work cut out for them on that one. As Estelle Rosolio now waiting to see where that's going to slot her in, but a strong one for her. Yeah, the thing with the cold, dry snow we have, when you crank one of those turns, you often blow off a cloud in your face. On a normal day's riding, great fun. When you're trying to pick a technical line, super unhelpful. Turns out being able to see is quite useful. Yeah, you, you, you pit yourself and all of a sudden you lose vision. And it might only be for a couple of meters, but it's enough to just lose the exact precise view of where you're trying to go. Uh, so Estelle, as you said, maybe missing a feature there. Judging criteria, all looking pretty solid. They, they're lo loving the line, fluidity good, air and style solid, all the way across the board. So we're going to see what kind of number that's going to put on the board for Estelle Rosolio. As the judges consider there's some checking the screen there, you can see some nervous discussion going on. What score is going to be coming through for her here? I hate this bit as a rider. If you can see her wanting them, like she wants it, give it to her. Let's see what they have to say. 75.33, sliding her into second position. A great run there from Estelle and well earned points. Yeah, strong run for the French rider. So Michaela Davis, me and fending off a big challenge for her spot in the hot seat, but we are just getting started still. Three of the best riders in the world up top. Tiffany Paratin, she is the reigning world champion riding out of Verbier. She was a rookie last year and took the title. This year she's had a bit of a rough start, so she's sitting in fifth. She's going to be looking to bump herself up. Uh, sorry, excuse me, sitting in fourth. Going to be looking to bump herself up into that third place spot as only three of these women are going to be, be making their way into the free ride world tour finals. Yeah, it's a super brutal part of the year. A lot of pressure on her, a veritable pressure cooker of a situation. Let's see what she makes of this dish as she drops in. Oh, interesting start, going outright. Oh, we've seen a bit of that today, but there's plenty of good points to be made out there. So Tiffany, another regular foot rider with her back to the cornice, cruising on down the ridge. The backdrop here, the Purcell Mountains, just glowing here in this morning sunshine. It's been a gorgeous day at Kicking Horse. A little touch up of snow that we've seen giving the riders just that extra bit of confidence to really go hard and uh, and pin it through. So Tiffany now coming down over top of the cornice as she makes her way looking for her entry into this face. See how far she's gonna work down here. We saw it work super well for Michaela. I wonder if she's gonna go for a similar entrance as she cuts back on that heel side turn dropping into a similar zone, but pulling furthest riders right, finding some fresh a fresh entrance, no mean feet, and a nice air there, off the bat, clean stomp, into the darkness of the shade, finding yet another air, reaching, oh, oh catching the, the grab, bars. but just getting bucked by the powder. So Tiffany going down, and now over top of this feature, is she gonna be able to stack up anything else? Coming out of the pow cloud, just rolling off of that one. So that's really unfortunate, almost, Hard to tell how deep the snow is in spots. The wind has been moving it around. It looked like that was just a bit deeper than Tiffany expected, and the nose of the board just sinking under the surface. Yeah, you can see the disappointment in her body language as she comes out the bottom there. Really great start there, finding a fresh air, which is super difficult at this stage. And just unfortunately, setting that stance a little too forward, rolling over the bars. Here at Kicking Hall, sometimes you get bucked. Yeah, that was a tough one. As we saw, I mean, we're we're way down in the field. We've seen all of the snowboard and ski men and all of the ski women. We've got a nice crowd gathered here at Kicking Horse cheering on the riders. But to be this deep in the field and still find a completely untapped zone, impressive scoping there from Tiffany Perton, the reigning freeride world tour champion. Not going to be her day today. So another big one fended off there as we see Tiffany coming in, spraying the powder. That first air absolutely bolts, and then it was the second one where it all comes undone. Just a deeper patch of snow, that variability in wind deposition. Becoming her Achilles heel as the wind absolutely howls around us here on the ridge. We're about to lose our tent, I think. So score coming in for Tiffany Peloton there into third with a 53-6-7. So another one 
fought off by Michaela Davis, me and the Aussie rider sitting pretty in the hot seat. And with only two riders to go, Michaela gonna be guaranteed to be on the podium, but it's not, a podium is not a guarantee for her to make it through the cut. She needs the W to make that happen. So we still have the top two riders in the current overall still to come. Mm. Perhaps uh, Michaela's experience with the blowing dust of Australia's barren outback, giving her the slight edge here in this cold, light, dry snow that we have in Kicking Horse, BC. As right. we see Anna Orlova in the start gate, all smiles. Anna Orlova is another one in a is kind of similar fashion to what we've seen from Ludo Giodiat. She was a rider who would qualify onto the tour and then not quite make the cut, come back through the challenger, re-qualify. It's been a couple of journeys for her around the block, but now she's kind of clicked into her, her own rhythm and is finding herself sitting second overall on the Freeride World Tour. So Anna Orlova really locking in her style and finding uh, you know great success so far in the 2023 campaign. Yeah, it's a, it's a real testament, I think, that sometimes you know these riders do learn even more as they have to go back through the Challenger Series to retake their place on the Fruro World Tour. But there's a lot of good learning to be taken from that. You learn a lot about your riding, about how you like to compete. It's all very specific for each rider. There's various ways of doing things. And you just love seeing a success story where they fight for that and really power through to do it yet again and take their spot where they deserve to be. Yeah, exactly. Going kind of back to the drawing board in Cormier where she hails out of and finding uh, finding the ability to just lock in on another level of riding. Anna Orlova way out to the rider's right in fully a couple untracked sections and pinned through that upper section. Getting back across the hill looking for this air. We've seen a fair bit of tra traffic on. Struggling a little bit with speed there into a very sharky zone. Riding through the rocks and we've got a little bit of a slab has cut off there. Hopefully she's managed to hold on up top. I can see her still on the top of the screen, so she's managed to fire her way above that. Really strong there in a dicey situation from Anna all over. Yeah, slipped into that gully and managed to stay. It was the high point there, releasing an Anna Orlova in a nice safe spot, but uh, just having a little pause as I think she just got a little bit Whoa. bucked on that and uh, just finding an air <laughs> in those trees. Wow, the strength of the woman there to like set that little slab off and then fight for a few more ears. She's just kept going through that. It'll be interesting to see what the judges make of that. It's kind of something outside of your control and you have a little stability issue with that. You can see her kind of gesturing like, yeah, what? What what's just happened? Yeah. So those high points uh, where, where the snow falls away on both sides, definitely not much holding the snow up there. So you do kind of risk it a fair bit when you go into those zones. Anna Orlova, great start, really fast, and just a little bit hung up, as you said, Sam, into this section. I love the technique there, it's just on that heel side edge, just fight to make that takeoff, put it down clean, find a fresh landing and stomp it smooth. Interestingly, sort of a, a tricky one to judge, I would have thought. Yeah, <laughs> she's <laughs> gesturing like, I don't know, quite know what to make of that myself. She's been dinged, you can see on the fluidity there. She feel a little hard done, like not hard done by, but you can kind of understand that in the situation she was given. Great mountain sense to stay on top of that pocket. Yeah, Anna Orlova, happy to see her safe and sound in the finish line. Just kind of trading, trading war stories there with Michaela Davis Meehan as the two of them looking back up and. And now the nervous wait begins. Woo! Judgment yes. day, it's crunch time. <laughs> so we cut to a view of the judges wrestling with mitts. I never understood how people could wear mitts. You, fingers are there for a reason. Well, I think today, if any day is a mitten day, <laughs> it's today up here on the ridge at Kicking Horse. So the judges definitely having a look at that one, Anna Orlova. The fluidity definitely um, going to be going to be ding for that one. She had even even before she got kind of stuck in the gully, trying to move across that. So 68-33 for Anna Orlova, sliding her into third position. Five riders in the field, three spots into the finals. Michaela Davis Meehan with a big, big campaign, a big case to get herself in there. She had a big hill to climb. She's done her part, but the most dangerous rider for Michaela's campaign to get into finals is in the start gate right now. Two starts, two wins for Katie Anderson.
while that was possibly not what Anna Oliver really had in mind, it's still sitting in third, which is putting the pressure on Katie to deliver here as those two wrestle for that top spot. Big moment for the final run of this big day in the freeride competition. Yeah, so Katie Anderson riding out of Fernie, BC, another one who didn't make the cut last year, back through the Challenger Tour. She won the Challengers, and then she came back with a whole new Katie that has been unstoppable so far this year on the 2023 Freeride World Tour season. Uh, to be totally honest with you, what we've seen from Katie this year is what I've been expecting to see from Katie the whole time. That World Cup border cross background, she's mm. so strong on her board, but riding from Fernie, she's comfortable in big terrain and she's comfortable in, in, in good snow. Yeah, exactly. Katie started off the season with the big don't argue, chucking a full on no holds bars approach right through the entire field. You can't really argue with two wins right off the bat as she makes her way out to the rider's right side, warming those legs up. But she's oh, Ew. dumping yeah. the nose there. Uh, that is heartbreaking for Katie Anderson. We've seen this section with that, that wind sculpted snow. Saw a couple of riders have little moments, but that's the first one we've seen just get gobbled up by it. The, once the nose on your board goes under, you are, well, you're straight over the bar. So Katie Anderson is gonna need to reset her head before she drops into the steep section, coming off the cornice now. A newish entry, finding that similar air that we saw just before, powering off that super strong landing, getting another air, Little bit of a washout again, so unfortunately, commentators curse with the big don't argue. Kevin wow. Walsh is having a bit of the last laugh here, unfortunately. Gonna yeah, that makes this division a bit more interesting. That is tough for Katie Anderson, as she's pretty much past the features now. She's going to ride out in the powder. I, I honestly, a, a weird one for Katie, yeah. losing the nose at the top, and then I, I have to wonder if she was just mentally a little bit rattled coming onto the face. Yeah, I mean, to be honest. Looking at that first crash, like, I think it's one of those things where you're probably not even thinking about that part of the zone. You're thinking about the medieval line, you're thinking about where things are going to get dicey, maybe just slightly too casual on that top bit, where you really think by this stage in the field you'd be just cruising along, you know. It's just one of those things. Sometimes you just turn off a little bit on the easier terrain. I've seen it before with the snowboarders uh, and other events, and that's just super unfortunate. Yeah, you could kind of see her board with a little ripple. The board went up and then coming over the backside of it, the nose just diving. Nice entry into the face for Katie Anderson, coming down to this chunky one, landing onto the heel side into the next air. And it's this feature that actually gets her unstuck, the board bouncing out forward. Yeah, kind of an interesting one there. I just wonder if that's the sort of second time we've seen that smaller air get people unstuck. So a 33-point ride there for Katie Anderson. Yeah. Uh, rounding out our women's snowboard division. Not what she would have wanted today, but it's going to be an interesting look at the rankings as things change up. All right, well, we'll see what our big picture from today's event looks like. Michaela davis Meehan under pressure and delivering with an 83-point run. Estelle Rosolio and Anna Orlova, that's your top three. Tiffany Perreton and Katie Anderson, unfortunately, both going down. So a really, really interesting day and huge credit for Michaela, similar to what yeah. we saw in Ski Women, just performing under pressure. Yeah, Aussie, 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 yo, 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 Australia Day here in Kicking Horse. So we see the, the crowd braving the chilly temps down in the basin. Luckily, they're sitting in the sunshine. Got to say, a bit jealous of that sunbeam shining down on the crowd at the finish area. We're going to take a look here as we go back down to see our ceremony here. Those are your podium finishers in the snowboard women's category. Michaela Davis, me and Estelle Rosolio and Anna Orlova is your top three results today from Kicking Horse. And Sam, I'm on the edge of my seat as we are going to look in at what this has done to the overall rankings as we see it shake out here. Katie Anderson holding on to the top spot. Anna Orlova and wow. Estelle Rosolio and unfortunately, Michaela davis Meehan needed Anna or Estelle to be a little bit lower for her to jump over and into the qualifying spot. So she did her bit, but she needed them to do their bit and by such a slim margin. So wow. Estelle, Anna and Katie moving on to the Freeride World Tour Finals.
And we are going to go down and check in with the kicking horse champion, Michaela Davis Meehan, delivering under pressure with the win. Michaela, describe that run for us. Stellar run from top to bottom. Oh, it was amazing. The snow was so good. Um, I had a backup run that I was going to do, but I blew that one off. I wanted the rock star run and I'm glad I did it. <laughs> well, huge congratulations locking down the gold medal here, kicking horse golden, delivering on the day. Congrats to Michaela Davis Meehan. Thank you. Cheers. All right, well, we just see what it took for Michaela to lock down the W here. A beautiful powder experience wrapping up the snowboard women's category. Did the kicking horse stop on the free ride world tour delivering fireworks end to end starting with snowboard men wrapping with snowboard women top to bottom unbelievable show today yeah as we expected huge fireworks from today massive runs massive ears stomps Big crashes as well. It was a really tough one for the crunch time. Yeah, roller coaster of a day. And we want you at home to have your say. You're going to go online at vote.freerideworldtour.com and vote for who you thought was the rider of the day. It's your chance as an audience to have your say in the outcome here of the Kicking Horse Golden BC Freeride World Tour Stop Rider of the Day. Who's it going to be winning those black diamond golden gloves? Mate, I don't know. There has been some absolute claims to fame here. I think we've seen some things we're going to think of for a long time. There's been a couple of massive ears that I think will really stick in people's mind. And, yeah, huge congratulations to the riders today in tough conditions, putting on a beautiful show. Well, a big thanks to all of you at home. That's going to do it for us here in Kicking Horse. Stop number three is a wrap. We are heading to Fieberbrunn for the next stop. Free Ride World Tour Finals coming up with a, a two-run format. Thanks to you. A huge thanks to the Free Ride World Tour team and the team here at Kicking Horse Mountain Resort, Resort and Golden BC. A banger day. We'll see you in Austria. It's party time! Welcome to Austria. Bieberbrunn is the spot for the first stop in the FWT Finals. New format, two runs, everybody gets two goes. Really just working it and perfecting. Wow. Cork 7 down. And perfectly landing that. That was probably fun to watch. What a showman.